I am Narsu Halu, Director, Human Resource Development Center, University of Hyderabad. I extend a warm welcome to all the participants who are attending this one day national seminar on credit, <coughs> national credit framework and credit transfer policy. I have a great pleasure in welcoming today our beloved Vice Chancellor, Professor BJ Rao Garu, who has given all the support and encouragement to conduct this particular seminar. And I must sincerely thank the support that we got from IOE, Institute of Eminence, that we are having from the Government of India, and the support that we got through. And I extend a warm welcome to Professor Mangal Sundaram, Professor of Chemistry from IIT Madras, Chennai, who was the architect behind or the architect of NPTEL. And we have with us Dr. Gopu Kumar, Joint Secretary, University Grants Commission. And also we have with us Professor K. Srinivas from NEPA, Professor and Head ICT, and Dr. Subramanya, Principal. RV College of Engineering. All the resource persons are here. I extend a warm welcome to all of them. I also extend welcome to our registrar and my colleagues from University of Hyderabad. Thank you. At the outset, I would like to say a few things about uh, the purpose for which we are conducting this seminar. You all remember post-1991, a, a, a tremendous uh, change and impact has been created in accessing the higher education, accessing the knowledge, accessing the wealth. And we have seen the transformation in the last 30 years, how people from different categories accessed higher education and getting benefit. Yeah, we are all happy with the way that India is progressing and uh, um, now we are one of the largest five economies in the world. But times are changing. If you take that 30 years as an era, 1990 to 2020 is one era. And now 2020 to 2050, we are going to see a big changes, especially with two <coughs> uh, topics, namely digital revolution and the other is climate change. And keeping in these things, can we make our students beyond or besides employment as creators of wealth, can they contribute to the economy of the nation so that we will become a developed nation by 2047 as designed by our uh, government of India. In this process, the new education policy has come in with more flexibility. The whole structure of NEP is built on flexibility. So to bring in practice this flexibility, there are certain facilities that are provided to the students, provided to the institutions. And with the ABC being gazetted, it has become a rule. And now how it can be implemented and make our students to feel comfortable in the process of learning. And thereby, not only that we make them as good citizens, but also make them as wealth creators. That's a word that is being coined now. That can be, if you see last five years, there are about uh, 30 unicorn companies around the world uh, flourishing and out of 30, two-thirds are from India. We all can feel proud. Can we see more and more in hundreds from India? And it can happen through our students. And we are the, <coughs> it is the time for us to do the right things, to see that our students are provided with all necessary skill sets. In this journey, we thought that the idea that is proposed by UGC should be popularized and then make people to understand things. In the entire discussions in the seminar, we are going to talk about why, what and how. Why we should talk about this topic, what is it and how it should be implemented. I hope all the uh, resource persons will do uh, the uh, justice in this direction and you as participants can feel free to interact with them and I request 
some of the participants to note down and in the evening when we are going to have valedictory, I request some of them to come and speak their <coughs> uh, observations about the seminar. Okay? With this, I uh, extend a warm welcome to all of you again. Now I request our Vice Chancellor, Professor B.J. Rao Garu to address. Sir, please. Good morning to all of you. <clears throat> welcome to this uh, very important uh, one-day conference on national credit framework and credit transfer policy. I also want to formally welcome our senior colleagues in this area, Gopukumar Garu, Sundaram Garu, Srinivasan Garu, and of course our own HRDC director, Narsim Lugaru, and others. <coughs> this particular topic has been very, very dear to some of us. <coughs> this topic was dear to some of us even before NEP <coughs> came upon us. Because finally, uh, education <coughs> as a process <coughs> has to lead to quantifiable, <coughs> transferable units. And it is in that context that this particular uh, theme <coughs> bring, brings us close to that reality. Education, when it started, let's say in ancient India and anywhere in the world, it started as a process, process of learning. But then quickly, the learning became a product. <coughs> a good process always leads to a product. <coughs> and therefore, this process of good education, good learning pr processes, gave rise to a lot of information, a lot of insights, content, and therefore products got generated and when products get generated they should be evaluated, quantified and transferable. And that is what we are trying to do it and not do it just for the sake of doing it but do it with a purpose. Purpose being generate the citizenry who are skillful, who are productive, who can even generate wealth and generate thought leaders. So the goals are well set now. We just don't want to educate people for the sake of education, but we want to educate people anywhere in the world for the sake of nation building activities. So the quality and the quantity and the transferability and the scalability comes into picture. In that sense, education has become education technology and this particular conference has good number of education technologists who will explain to the stakeholders how technology has to be combined productively in the educational learning processes. So you can see there is a now there is a confluence of many many threats coming together. But in the wake of NEP 2020, we still haven't learned, as a nation, we have not learned how to do it properly. It is in that context I felt that this particular seminar that we are holding nationwide makes a lot of relevance. I hope all the proceedings are recorded and we will share all the proceedings to whoever wants in the country at no cost. <clears throat> And in this proceedings, I have one or two wish lists. The wish list items are, <clears throat> let us explain clearly <clears throat> to the country, to the educational system in the country, how the credit policy has to be progressive, should be much more knowledge driven <coughs> rather than commercial interest driven let us set up that kind of model and second let us define <coughs> proper procedures and mechanisms to transfer the credits this becomes 
a very important uh, essence of uh, credit choice based credit system which we want to parcel it to parcel it out to different units as the stakeholders desire so these one or two items have to be properly defined so that there is no ambiguity in the way people understand right now there is a lot of ambiguity in this in this in this domain so let us try to structure it let us try to promul you know uh, 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 propose something that even uh, uh, even a beginner in this field can understand and appreciate i want just say few couple of more things and then i will leave the podium those things are <clears throat> even in this high technology era there are mind related barriers for many people to acquire and implement technology usefully and in a facile manner if we can break that barrier if we can train those minds so that they can quickly <coughs> absorb and adopt the available technology that would help education a lot in the country <coughs> younger crowd is much more alert and inviting on the technology front but not so young crowd i don't want to use the word old are still are still not fully into it at the classroom teaching level so that barrier if we can if we can somehow start breaking that would be extremely useful most of us do not know the new technological breakthroughs that are happening even in education field most of the senior citizens do not know i must say this they are very good teachers but they may not have absorbed acquired the 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 technological prowess that is available now so if you can just bridge that that will be extremely useful because we have excellent very very committed teachers who probably don't have that nimbleness to uh, acquire the technology and use them in the classroom that's number 1 <coughs> number 2 if we can use india as a country where we can do lot of experiments on new educational models and show it to the world that these educational models are useful in a larger context that will be that will be extremely uh, useful the the model that i have in my mind is that you know in mit they did poverty alleviation experiments for which nobel prize was given you remember poverty alleviation experiments could have been done in india we didn't do it in fact indian samples were taken to do the poverty alleviation experiments for which economy economy nobel prize was given so if we are ahead in the game and do experiments in the education field which could give deep insights for future educational model that will be extremely useful and we must take lead in generating testable models in education technology if you do it in a hypothesis driven manner in a scientific manner taking sample size and inducting enough statistics in it and following null hypothesis and see if we can test the models which are useful for generating deep insights in our classroom remember in india there are lot of slow learners have we generated enough educational tools to help the slow learners i don't think so unless we take the slow learners along with us the impact of nep 2020 can never be felt we have lot of fast learner they they will learn anyway whether nep 2020 is there or whether educational technology is there whether credit framework is they will anyway do it but what about the bulk of slow learners who have language barriers who have technology barriers who are first generation education students how do we help them do we have some special tricks up our sleeves to help them in education and technology have we done some experiments to check whether certain things can be tweaked to help them so if we can bring in enough scientific methodology null hypothesis based methodology to help slow learners average learners late learners learners who come again with a gap we have all kinds of interesting people 
our women force can come back and they want to learn again with a gap do we have anything special that they can do and pick up further so all these interesting variations we should address in this field and see if we can come up with some tangible solution only India can produce those solutions the West is not worried about these because their problems are different these are our problems so my supplication is just think of these interesting problems look at education technology as a problem area where we can solve some of these if we can do this I think we will make lasting contribution not only for India for the globe <coughs> Some of these ideas how to be discussed is my intention and I hope uh, we, we, we go through such discussions and we document some of these and provide a model for the entire country to follow in the years to come within this new education policy framework. Again welcome all of you. Thank you that you have come here and then let's, let's move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for uh, that wonderful uh, uh, input. You have set the tone for uh, the seminar. And uh, some of the issues that you have raised, definitely the technology is, in, uh, is going to address this uh, problem of slow learners and average learners also. And uh, we have done some experiments in this direction. Maybe Professor Steen was, uh, in his lecture, he will be addressing this particular topic. And uh, I have now pleasure in inviting uh, Professor uh, Mangal Sundaram. Uh, he will be talking about uh, this particular uh, uh, credit framework, why, what and how. I must thank Professor, uh, Professor Mangal Sundaram for accepting our invitation. For <coughs> the sake of uh, the participants, I would like to Brief, uh, briefly report about uh, Professor Mangal Sundaram. Yes. <laughs> he is Professor Emeritus in the Department of uh, Chemistry, IIT Madras. Can you believe that he is 70 years old? No. He is still active and no, he. 66. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he still go to class and uh, take classes for uh, the students even after his retirement. And uh, his major uh, interest in the area of technology enhanced learning. I do not know how many of you uh, know about NPTEL. He was the architect and he was the man behind. And he was there for almost 12 years, 2003 to 2015, right from the inception of NPTEL to launching till 2013 uh, when they have launched uh, Swayam Portal. So he was the architect behind that. And then he was the first coordinator of even Swayam Prabha. Uh, if you are uh, watching DTH Swayam Prabha videos, it is all uh, because of uh, Sir's contribution. He is an acad eminent academician member of the governing board of India's leading skill council known as NASCAM IT and IT services. And <coughs> he is also a member of Empowered National Committee on MOOCs and Swayam and assists Ministry of Education in the establishment of online certified learning processes. Uh, you name any activity that is associated with uh, the online learning, uh, Professor Mangal Sundan will be there. And uh, that was his contribution. And I welcome you, sir, for this uh, uh, seminar and uh, share your thoughts. Thank you very much. While I do spend a lot of time thinking about technology, the gadgets really scare me about the way they change in time and change in place so quickly. I want to thank you, very esteemed Vice Chancellor and also Professor Narsimalu for the invitation. Um, sir, how much time do I have? Because you don't give professors time. One hour? Okay, that's good. So about 40, 45 minutes I will try. And if it doesn't, uh, it's 10, 20, in my watch is yes, fine. Okay. So, thank you all for being with uh, us in this one day workshop. The National Institute Ranking Framework has already taken all of you by, you know, leaps and bounds to work very hard on various things. But the more serious problem is not about ranking ourselves, but how to rank our students well and how to train them well in the long process. And therefore, teaching them and providing them the opportunities, particularly in the 
era of the demographic dividend that we are currently experiencing and about to experience a maximum in the next three or four years, it's very, very important for us to seriously consider the transformation and also the requirements. My presentation will be general. I will not give you specifics of how to do credit transfer for specific schemes, but I'm here for the whole day, so if there is any discussion involved, I'll be quite happy to tell you whatever I know. I'll be happy to share that. But this is more about the system as a whole as I have understood. And the most important person in the beginning of my academic career that I want to make uh, my salutations to, unfortunately he is no more, he passed away in 2012, Professor Paul Goodman from Carnegie Mellon University. And it's important to tell you that he was involved in the very first exercise of technology enhanced learning workshop that happened in 1999 in Taj Koromandal Hotel in, uh, and sponsored by IIT Madras, the two very famous people, Professor R. Natarajan, who was the former chairman of AACT. He was the director at that time. I had just joined IIT Madras three years before that. So he called me and said, you are aware of technology, you have been using technology in your classroom and so on. So I want you to help Professor Anand, who was at that time the dean of academic courses, and later Professor Anand became the director of IIT Madras in 2001. We had a long discussion and tell happened, then 2003, the ministry sanctioned the technology enhanced learning program. But in 1999, we wrote down four activities. One was the creation of course contents. I ran the workshop. I mean, I was the technical coordinator for the workshop in 1999. And end result is for the IAT, there was one glass I lost to two UPSs. <laughs> but I gained so many other things from Carnegie Mellon and other people, so we will not worry so much about that. The four outcomes were talked about at the time. One was creating course contents that would help teachers in the whole engineering education sector to update themselves and also to use these contents freely without any limitation for their classrooms. So, this was called the Open Educational Resource later by the UNESCO, but we already did that at that point of time. We had come up with that policy. 200 courses were identified in five major engineering disciplines and the basic science and management and language disciplines which are required for all the engineering students. The second discipline, second activity was digitizing all the educational content and all the publications in India using standard digital methods. Carnegie Mellon was very actively pursuing digitization. And remember the digitization project started in 1967 in the United States. And we were talking about 1999, digitizing content. Later on, Professor Balakrishnan in IAC Bangalore was awarded the 1 million digital content creation project as part of the similar ideas of digitizing the Indian content. Today, we have IAT Karakpur digitizing all available information resources in the National Digital Library Initiative, including what was there earlier. The third was online teaching and learning, where teachers are no longer available in one institution, but the experts were available in the other institutions, facilitating students to register for PhD programs with one mentor in the institute and another mentor in a distance institute and using this through the online method. And the last one is what you are today seeing everything, all activities about Swayam, creating a virtual university and creating a credit content course transfer and credit transfer policy. So all these four things were written. We required 45 crores in 1999. Ministry said no. If it is 45 crores, it had to go to across all the ministries and cabinet resolution is required. But MHRD at the time had a limit that the secretary and the minister can sanction 15 crores, which is the maximum for which they didn't have to go elsewhere. They said, therefore, remove everything, concentrate on course content creation. So NPTEL became the reality. So these two people, plus Professor Paul Goodman, who continued to advise me, I visited him in Carnegie Mellon many times, and uh, is, there is a very famous book that all of you as teachers should somehow 
uh, have a look into. It is called Organizational Learning Contracts, written by Professor Paul Goodman just before he died. I'll talk more about it in the later day, during the later, latter day. Okay? Now, the other two people whom I want to thank are Professor Srivatsan, former Professor of Electrical Engineering and retired from IIT Kanpur, and Professor Anup Re, who is my mentor in understanding pedagogies and pedagogical process as well as the technologies of technology enhanced learning. Okay? So, these are my institutional affiliations and thanks notes. It's important to thank all the people who have helped me. Okay, the talk is on three simple items. The problem statement, problem statement is philosophical, but please remember there are points in between each one of them. And then what are the current models that India is offering? And the learning process, namely how and why we need to do the credit transfer, but in, in general terms. And I will summarize it with two slides. Okay? The problem statement. Let us start with a very nice, beautiful article by Professor uh, David McKay many years ago on the internet. I saw this. And ever since I read that article, it is uh, in my mind for all the teaching learning required. Imagine a university called the Cambic, Cambridge and Warwick, if you want to say that, between, okay, Cambic University, where all students arrive with straight A grades, like University of Hyderabad, undergraduate students. They are successful, enthusiastic, and curious. By the time they leave, only one-third still receives straight A's. The other two-thirds get lower grades, do not enjoy their studies, and are not so fun to teach. Okay? <laughs> Beautiful article. It's five page. I think everyone should read this. Is Cambic University a success? Cambic could point to its excellent teaching assessment scores and argue that it's adding value. Students emerge no, knowing more. Future employers love the university's policy of assigning grades. Employment is, you know, assessors did not have to do the assessment. The university gives grades. They'll take those boys right away and girls right away. The university ranks its students, saving companies the bother of assessing job applications, applicants themselves. Okay, but should a university be a sorting service? Okay, language is powerful in that article. Isn't something wrong with an institution with that takes in mainly A quality input and turns out less than half A quality output? This is the fundamental policy that we have to keep in mind for credit assessment and credit enhancement and knowledge transfer and all these. This is statement number one. Second statement. If a university fails to turn out as much A quality enthusiasts as come in, is it in fact a place of intellectual destruction, throwing away the potential of the majority of the students? What are the roots of the destruction? This is something that all of you have to think in mind. Okay. Now, second question. The second problem statement all of you have heard many times in credit transfer, credit policies, and uh, credit assessment using external resources is outcome-based education, OBL, OBE, outcome-based learning. Outcome -based, it's called OBL process. Like the ODL, which is the open distance learning process in the open universities. Design and deliver a course with specific outcomes. Whatever that the student is expected to get at the end or design and deliver a program which consists of many courses. So there also you design and so that at the end of this program, three year BSc degree program, my chemistry students will be able to do this, 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 etc. And we assess them and we certify them. And they agree to be part of it when they join the university that they want to be certified on these things. Okay? And the program therefore then becomes a student centric program. It is not a teacher centric program. So our problem is how do we design that? And also how do we monitor the students for assessing the extent of match between what we say they should have, what they actually have. What is the gap between them and how do we fill up the gap? So this is problem statement two. Third, industry ready, employable, industry employable. You know everybody cribs around uh, universities are not helping very much. Please. As long as you are doing your job very thoroughly, systematically, and are following your heart in teaching the students the best of what you know, ignore the industry. <laughs> okay. 
ignore. But if you are not doing any of that, take serious cognizance of the industry's requirement, at least work towards that. Okay. So the industry ready employment, design and deliver a course with specific outcomes to suited to the employment. See how you define your credit system, how you define your outcome are all dependent on what you want the outcomes to lead to. And skills are essential components. Today, IT skills, without IT skills, no ministry can function. No ministry. Okay? Whether it's a ministry of, uh, you know, if you think the archaeology, the technology to understand archaeology, Neanderthal man, okay? technology is so heavy, therefore it is important to have skills, IT skills for even commerce, science, and archaeology students are movie industries everywhere. You know, technology is the maximum in the movie industry. I don't remember how many of you, when you watched one of the old Onion robot movie of uh, Robo movie of uh, Rajini Khan and the equivalent. At the end of the movie, for 17 minutes, the screen was going down. 17 minutes. I was the only person sitting in the theater. My wife was very embarrassed to be there. Everybody else left, but I said to her, "Look." I want to see what are all the technologies that these people are using to create this kind of animation. I wrote down some of them. And she said, you didn't come to the theater to study. You came to the theater to enjoy. Get out. Go home and look at all these things. But that's not the point. The point is, today technology is all pervasive. Therefore, your credit system, how does it take into account this enabling the students to produce newer technologies in addition to newer concepts. So these are all problem statements of the current credit policy. Okay, beautifully done. NEP has done a fantastic job, you know. After finally, after many, many years, there is a very clear cut document about what uh, the future should be for at least the next 20 years. It says in green, increased access, equity, and inclusion. And then again in green, online education and open distance learning. These two are emphasized by, therefore, in your credit policy, credit system, any university wants to manage, these things are important. Okay? And UGC today enables you to do that by giving you a handle for 40% of your courses to be actually sampled from sources outside of your institution if you agree those courses are very relevant to your students. So there is a handle given to you. So online and open distance. And of course, it's very important that infrastructure and learning materials accessible and available to learners all the times and learners with disabilities. Now, this is very important. NEP also says, you can see the, the green things, particularly the enable the study of one or more specialized areas at a deeper level. NEC does not say don't do research. NEC says, NEP says, do whatever, that's act as important, but there are other things which are also important. Research is the fundamental outgrowth of a university system. Uni United States today will not be an industry-led country, but for its university-based research after the Second World War, till today. The institution, the internet, is not an industry development. It is a fundamentally a research requirement of sharing information between individuals who are capable of understanding them. Mail system started that. And then after the mails came the internet. Internet was not meant to be used the way the commercially it is being done. But that's an outgrowth. And that has built an entire, therefore universities are fundamental in research, development and knowledge. Please let us not forsake that. If anybody comes and says, you teach what we want you to teach, you tell them that we will also do that, but we will continue to do what we do. Must enable personal accomplishment and enlightenment, publishing fantastic papers, publishing new ideas. That's part of the teaching and training policies, constructive public engagement and productive contribution. So this is are all, some of these things are from the NEP document. Okay. Now, NEP finally does a very beautiful recommendation that revamp the curriculum, which is what we are here, here uh, we are all about. Pedagogy, assessment, and student support for enhanced student services. So these are all the requirements of NEP in the new credit world. Now, let me skip this and come back if necessary at the end. This is one slide I would like to concentrate a little bit more. The pedagogy versus the andragogy. Okay? 
Andragogy is adult education. Malcolm Knowles came up with a very beautiful documentation for andragogy many years ago, professor of uh, uh, education psychology. And pedagogy, of course, all of you know Bloom, Benjamin Bloom and many others came up with a very beautiful document on how to systematize the outcome-based education using pedagogical techniques. We will see some of these things as the methods of how we implement the credit system. We'll see that later. But you see the first side, the left-hand side, is a more deterministic side and a directive side. The right side is an experimental side where the individual is getting enabled on his own or her own. The left side is for the teacher to decide what is to be learned, when it is to be learned, and how it is to be learned. School education, you need a pedagogy because the children do not know what to learn, how to learn. You need to systematize the education. The NCRT books are fantastic examples of pedagogically threaded sections of the NCRT. All NCRT books are pedagogy researched. Then you have primary techniques in education is transmittal delivery. The teacher says, the student picks up. The teacher talks, the student picks up. It's all transmittal. And then the learning is standard curriculum. The teacher says, this is the book. You have to read everything. The students don't ask questions why they should not read some of them. They have to read everything. Questions will be asked on every one of them. Questions will be asked on every one of them. And then the last is subject-centered learning. It's not necessary that the subject should be immediately useful for your life. You learn. And sometime later, you will find that certain subjects are useful, certain things that you, you are very happy that you learned some time ago. On the other hand, the andragogical is the higher education model. The higher education model tells you increasing self-directedness. Tell the students to find the directions and help them to find and settle down in the direction. Don't give them everything in that direction. Tell them to go search. Enable them and enable them to do experiences, that is experienced learning, laboratory experiments, tell them, hands-on discussions, problem solving cases. In credit transfer, all these issues are important. Okay? And then the learning is through the life applications. So the students in higher education must feel that what they learn is useful for certain life applications that are connected with their area of research. COVID, most fantastic and most grueling life application for a biotechnologist who wants to build a drug in a very short time with a specific goal, life applications, okay? And then competency-based. If you are competent to be a mechanical engineer, don't go settle down to be a management fellow. <laughs> be a mechanical engineer. But if you are competent to be a manager, stay as a manager. Don't middle around with engineering tools and technologies. Competency is very important, okay? Drive yourself towards the competencies. I think the, the university model, the entire credit model, teaching learning model, is essentially where we pitch ourselves in, in this particular table on the left side or on the right side or a superposition of the left and right side. These two are two major learning aspects that have come out in the last 100 years, okay? Now, the role of faculty, let me skip the slide because I want to see Talk to us uh, about the challenges that I have faced and the challenges you are facing and the challenges that the students are facing. Please don't think students are your challenge. For the students, the college is a challenge. <laughs> okay. Should see the other way around. The reason is, you see the next line, in the same line, changing curricula. You know, you come to the college, four years later what you have studied is no longer useful for what was needed at that point of time four years and before you came in, yes, data science was a fantastic subject. Everybody joins data science. There are million students in data science. Five years later, after they get the degree, data science has gone somewhere else. Okay? So students have challenges. They have to adopt themselves to the social requirements and their future. What is the challenge of us? These students are not motivated in our class. They are dull. They don't focus. So this is the teacher's challenge, which is the second. Like a lack of attention, focus in the classroom, and then the administration, like the university vice chancellor, registrar, etc. Finally, you have to pass everybody. You fail students in your institution, you are not going to get accreditation. Okay? You have to pass all of them, whether they are good or whether they are compl complemented or not. So, you see, these are the current challenges associated with our educational processes. So, these are all part of the problems that we face. Now, 
this is the most important problem that we have, the arrival of the internet. When you and I, many of you, not the, I think some of you here are much younger than me, therefore you have, you have, you have been here before, uh, after this has come. Internet and access device. Please read the proverb. Every man and woman, and woman, M-A-N, sorry, that's an M error, is given the keys to the gates of heaven. Little do they know beforehand that the same keys also open the gates of hell. <laughs> Chinese proverb. So, what does that mean? The keys, <laughs> okay. We have the keys for everyone, okay. There is no child in India which over a period of time will not have a mobile. And most children will also have tablets and computers and other things. So what is hell or heaven? That's that, okay? The internet. You decide how to use the internet using the keys given to you, you create heaven. If you don't use it properly, that's hell. This is modern world. And the students have these keys. Now therefore, the teachers, policies, credit systems, advice, everything, etc. should be to drive them to use the right keys for the right learning and the right play. Internet has everything that you and I taught, everything that you and I cannot teach, everything that you and I cannot even understand. Internet has all of them. Therefore, the students, if they ask you questions, why should I come to the college? They should see that because they came to the college, because they talk to you, because they had the guidance of all of you, they understand the systems better. Knowledge, libraries, do not make a person learned. What makes a person learned is the process of acquiring the knowledge by a directedness of those who have already learned. Those who are already learned, I mean learned, and therefore the teachers are fundamentally important, and that's a role that you have to have in any of the education system, okay? So now let's go to the actual models, okay? So that's about 20 minutes. Sorry, just one more. So two excellent models. All of you are part of the UGC and we have also a formal official representative of UGC. CBCS is one of the best things that I have seen over the years. I have seen the 119 subject divisions of CBCS and have downloaded many of the subject matters in chemistry, physics and botany and zoology because subjects which are connected to my area. I'm a chemist. I'm a trained theoretical chemist, studied chemistry and do research all the time in theoretical chemistry, students, etc. So I'm, I see that this is a very relevant uh, model for teaching and learning. CBCS, if you are not familiar, please get to know the CBCS document that you see. It gives you models on how the credits can be brought in. Details. Here is the AACT new curriculum which also talks to you if you are doing engineering subjects how the credits should be assigned and what are the subjects to be taught. There are two volumes on different syllabi for engineering and how common courses should be taught in the first year and how branching should be done in the second year. My daughter is, was a student of the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, undergraduate after her high school in Manamani in IIT Madras. We just packed her off saying that she was a Canadian by birth and she was entitled to Canadian education, government was ready to support her and so on. So at the age of 17, we packed her off. Okay. Not something that wives would be, mothers would be very happy about for single, I mean, one daughter, but she also went along. In the organization of the credit system that she had, there was flexibility in the first year. In the first year, everybody is a faculty of science student. In the second year, they choose three branches, whether chemistry, biochemistry, and another one or chemistry, physics and materials. They choose three branches and take courses in one of them. One of the three branches or three branches. The faculty advise them. There's a whole basket of courses. There are probably 100 courses, so they don't have to choose all of them. And then in the third year, they choose to become a major student. And in the fourth year, if they want to be honor student, courses are specific. They have to take this, this, this in order to do the honors course. 
So the credit system gradually moves the students from a larger base of free and open learning materials credited to a slightly smaller and a sort of a pyramidal structure. Okay? And also you can do multiple degrees. You can do a major in biochemistry and a minor in chemistry and a minor in physiology and a major in chemistry. And if I remember Peter Russell's book on the science of God where he says that he wanted to change to philosophy after halfway through his PhD program in physics, particle physics. And he became very much interested in philosophy. He came to India, he did. He looked around all the things and became very natural philosopher, but he wanted a PhD degree. Fortunately, in Oxford University, philosophy and physics came in the same faculty. <laughs> Therefore, whatever degree courses that he had done for his PhD physics, could be credited for getting his PhD degree in philosophy with additional courses. This enablement of transfer of credits and enabling faculty students between multiple disciplines is another extremely important thing. ACT gives a very beautiful summary of the curriculum on this. These are the models. This is the IIT Madras model. Beta courses. You see, third row, third column. Uh, 159 plus 27 elective, 159 core courses and 27 elective courses. And then you have humanities courses are 27. The 159 is the 84 plus 9 plus 72. Science plus core elective plus unallotted credit. Therefore, the students have to go between the departments to actually take the courses. It's not enough that they do only their department course. So it is important for them. The slides I will share with every one of you. I'll share with Nursing Gulu. So please feel free to use them. And uh, if you have any comments on that, please let me know. If there are mistakes also, please point out. Feel free to do that. Okay? Because every meeting I go to interact with faculty, I need to take home something for my learning. Okay? And credit load. This is McGill University course credit. McGill was my alma mater. I did my PhD in Montreal. And McGill University, there are three lines at the top you have to look at. 12 credits per term, full-time status, up to 14 credits maximum in probationary standing, up to 17 credits for maximum also is limited, by the way. You know. It's not possible for students to take 17 courses in one semester. The university says, no, go waste your time. You will not do justice to these 17 courses. This is the maximum you are permitted. <laughs> okay. So that's the limit. And then you have the details. What is a graded course? What is the maximum allowed credits? What is a student CGPA if you want to do specialized branches? You know, if you want to do honors biochemistry and you are a major in biochemistry, unless your CGPA is 7.5 and above, you will not be transferred to the honors program. Please remember the credit system puts the students in ladders it does not give them the biochemistry branch on day one like our JEE system does, like our examination system does. The student goes to an institution for a specific branch, four years, and then they find out in two years they don't like the branch. They become problems for the teachers in the third and fourth year. And I don't want to face an uninteresting student who failed an examination more than once more. <laughs> Okay. I don't want to face them three times or four times because I have to give them the examination to pass them. So there are two options I have. I don't fail any students, but those who don't do anything at all well, I give them the minimum grade, which means CGPA will not have any value on it, less than five. No contribution to CGPA. They haven't done it. Or the students come back, they say, somehow we'll do it better. We give one examination. Why do you want to face the students who are not interested in your subject by giving them exams again and again and again? Because they have to pass. Because our registrar will say, our HRD people will say, sir, please pass the course, otherwise the HRD will not uh, find uh, us comfortable. So this, these are things that you have to, CGPA requirements in each level. These are models that we have today. And the curriculum on skills engineering, AACT has a model where it says elective courses on skills in some of these topics, these nine topics, and these are out of the 11 topics listed by NASCOM and the Ministry of Information Technology. I'm, I'm co-chair of the committee, which is looking at the future skills learning program. And uh, there is a, a project which is being sanctioned to CDAC and uh, um, I believe seven other institutions under MIT. 
So these are topics. AACT suggests that colleges can put the students to take credits in these areas and put them as part of their academic credits for the certification and the final degree certificate that they will get. Okay. Now, Swayam, you have seen all of you. All of you are familiar with Swayam. If not, please become familiar because Swayam is going to be your household name. <laughs> your students will come back to you and say, I want to do this credit. And your vice chancellor will come and tell you, I hope he doesn't, but <laughs> he'll come and tell you, your department is not having any Swayam credit, I'm getting a problem from this. 10%, 20% credit, there are limits on that. Swayam is the platform. By the way, what is Swayam? Any of you know? What does Swayam stand for? You know. You are, yeah, you know, you are part of it, right? <laughs> study, study web actives by young and aspiring minds. You know, the word Swayam was told before somebody actually expanded it. And the expansion was provided by Professor Deepak Fatak in IIT Bombay. But the word Swayam was given to him as the name for this project. Now, she said, find an acronym for, I mean, expand this acronym. So he sat down and thought about all these things and finally put all the English words together and came up with his name. Study Web Actives, uh, Study Web Actives, by young and aspiring minds, <laughs> okay? But it's an important part. It's a national portal, okay? It's a national portal for online certification and online credits. A part of it you have to inc include in any of your, uh, the curriculum development. And also it allows you the massive open online course model that came first from Canada in 2008 by two people, Robert Downing, and uh, there is one other professor uh, in, uh, Athabasca University, the massive open learning initially was not a course directed uh, platform. It was a platform which built the learning materials through the participation of 2,500 participants of which about 20 students were registered in the University of Manitoba for credit. The remaining out of the only 20 were re registered for the examination and for credit. The rest of them were contributors. What is the percentage? It's 0.1 percent, okay, of students for a course who are part of credit system. The rest of them are onlookers and they contribute. But later on, it was changed in 2011 by the Stanford University professor in the AI course into a structured instructional process. And today we have thousands and thousands of MOOCs, and we have credit certification and proctored certification. In India, proctored certification was introduced by us in NPTEL because we didn't want the students to write the examination sitting at home watching their computers or watching their mobile and other books while they look like they are watching their computers. <laughs> we don't want to do any of that. So we said proctored examination was important. They had to go to a certificate center, an exam center, identify themselves. And I have a very simple, nice story. One student, we had an age limit, 18 was the age limit for any student. One student wrote to me, at that time I was still the NPTEL coordinator. He said, sir, I want to apologize for writing this mail. I am a 14 year old boy and I have taken part in the data science and algorithms course. I'm very much interested. I wanted to certify myself. But now I realize I made a bad entry in my age limit. I put my age as 18, but now you are asking for my identity card, which says I'm only 14 years old. <laughs> okay because identity card is based on this uh, date of birth school certificate. Therefore, will I be permitted to enter the, write the examination? Will you kindly allow me? I wrote a mail back to him. I mean, people asked me, uh, I, many of them said, no, 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 he already lied, he should not be. You should tell him until 18, you go study your high school. I said, no, I don't believe in that. He told a lie and he is still a minor. You can, you can, <laughs> say it's all right, but you have to tell him that he told a lie and tell him not to do this again. If he needs an exception, he should ask for it in the beginning, not in the end. Towards the end of the process, he should not ask for ex exception. You should ask for exception in the beginning. So I wrote a mail to him saying that what you did was bad. However, as the coordinator of this project, I'm happy to allow you to write an examination if you can qualify. I don't have a problem. And the NPTEL committee with which I was requesting them, they said, okay, Margaret, you can do that, let him certify. The boy got the a, a or B grade, whatever it is, and he was very happy. So allow everybody credit transfer, credit certification, allow anyone and everyone to learn, while at the same time, 
give credits in your university to those who are part of your university. Okay. So I am also gives you training for faculty development programs. Many of the NPTEL courses are FDA courses, and now Swayam courses from the UGC are also becoming FDA courses. And higher education and higher secondary school certification is also part of the curriculum because the National Institute of Open Schooling is also joined to the uh, Swayam platform. And 11th standard and 10th standard certification, 12th standard certifications are also possible. And then you have teacher training and uh, higher and secondary education school certificates. These are all allowed. For the future, we need skills and training leading to special certificates and diplomas. They can also be part of your regular curriculum, but a certain weightage is given. Certificates of merit and recognition of domain expertise. You know, if a student does in a particular domain a certain number of online courses and they are connected to each other in the pedagogical thread of learning, then you give them he is an expert in this area or she is an expert in this area. These are called microcredits. Course, Coursera, I'm sure, I'm sure you are familiar with the edX you are familiar with. In NPTEL, we get it as a domain certification. And then you have multiple language offerings. Today, it is important for students to learn, if they wish to, in their language, all the subjects which are probably available only in English. Therefore, it is our responsibility as local language experts to translate some of these things. Those of you who are experts in Telugu, please join the translation team. Those who are experts in Tamil, I mean, I'm joining the Tamil experts team. I mean, I'm, I can read, speak, and uh, write in Tamil. I don't have a problem. I, I did my schooling in Tamil. So the point is multiple language learning. These are all part of the way we allow students to credit themselves. Anyway, all of you are familiar with the three projects in PTEL. NME, ICT, there are three projects. I'll leave this, this slide with you for you to look at in more detail. Okay. Okay. Now the question is now we have talked about the problems, we have talked about the models, and now we will talk about how we can do this. And that is also known. Teaching is an age old art. <laughs> okay. Two thousand five hundred year old art. And in India, we talk about Ekalavya, who was the first distance education student recorded in history. Okay? I mean, Americans may say whatever they want to say. The, the Prussians may say whatever. But our historical records, whatever it is, the conceptual idea of Ekalavya and the conceptual idea of the internet access that I have in this little device that I carry okay, was what... Uh, People have anecdotically, you can say that, that Yasoda opened Krishna's mouth and found the whole world. Well, this is my world's mouth. <laughs> you know, with this, I can see any part of the world, practically. G, G, G map, anything. Tell me, tell me what is it that I cannot access in internet. If I am smart enough, I can access in internet what you cannot access using dark web, using all the, I mean, Anything that is possible today is possible on the internet. Therefore, what we have to do as academics, what is our role? What are the standards that we have to follow? And how do we assess and how do we certify online? And as administrators, what are our roles? Okay. This is one example of an online course that many of us can contribute. This is one of the ways by which we can do credit transfer. You see, this is a standard so I am open online courses. There are six, uh, I mean, hexagons, you can see the discussion forums, and the content is right in the middle, the blue forum, content creation, videos, lectures, and so on. And then you have assignments, hangouts, and all these things. I run one MOOC course every semester or every second semester, the chemistry one and chemistry two. There are usually 700 or 800 students who are registered, and about 300 students will do the first assignment. By the time they do the fourth assignment, it'll be about 40 of them. Rest of them, I don't know what they do, but they are there. Okay? And those who will write the examination will be about 60 or 70 out of the 600. And then out of the 60 or 70, I find about five students absolutely brilliant. I send them letters at the end of the course. You have done extremely well. If you want to visit IIT Madras, please feel free. Let me know and we can enable your visit, even if it is financially to be supported. We'll, we'll be very happy to have you here. I, the NPTEL is doing that. So this is the online models advantage. You train million students. 
it's like the cricket stadium you know right now australia india match 10000 people will be watching but only about 50 to 100 people will be following ball by ball the 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 quality of the pitch and the quality of the bowling and the techniques etc that's only still another 100 or 200 the rest of us go there to enjoy the atmosphere <laughs> we enjoy the ground we go to college to feel that we are in an educational institution but you have to learn so you can see that MOOCs is a very large platform for you to simultaneously reach out to lots and lots of people. These are uh, access to OER. Now we have 100 million users in the MOOCs. And uh, you see this Swayam Prabha, which is a television program that started in 2016. And uh, now we have 34 channels. I think the next slide has the details, probably. Yeah. 32, 34 channels now we have, and it's going to be 60 channels soon. We have 10, 11 channels for CEC. NPTEL has about six channels. IIT Professor Assisted Learning, Paul, which is the lecture materials for the JE aspiring students, JE main aspiring students. Lectures are based on the NCRT. There are 600 plus lectures on biology, physics, mathematics, and chemistry, four, four subjects. And these lectures are free, they can be downloaded, they can be used by any of your students, any of your college, high school, they're all there. And then the Indira Gandhi National Open University and other open universities together. So there are about uh, 34 channels right now, the number is to be updated. And the Swayam Prabha also provide, you can take certain Swayam Prabha courses, video lecture courses, and then build an examination and a credit system around it if it fits your curriculum and the syllabus. And you see that it is uh, eight hours a day, repeated two times. Therefore, you see that the students can read them when they are home or when they are in the office or when they are elsewhere. And it's available on the mobile, Reliance Geo, the My Geo uh, TV. If you download the Geo TV app on any mobile, not Reliance, it's an app now you can see all the 34 MHRD channels coming live. That is, as it is being transmitted, you see the same lessons on these channels. Okay? So this is another way by which we can create, without having to recreate course contents, we can use some of them. And the website for you is this swayamprabha.gov.in. Okay? This is the formal website launched in 2017 by the then uh, President Sri Pranav Mukherjee, okay? the learning process. Now, this is the last part of the talk. This is something that I am sure you have heard, but I am going to reiterate it because the methods of learning and the methods of understanding do not change with time. We still do not understand how somebody understands things. We do not know the mechanism of intelligence, but we do this by repetition, okay? usually. The most beautiful anecdote on repetition, the way we teach the same course several times, was given by Professor Anant in one of the NPTEL talks. Of course, he does it in every talk. And every talk I also attend. Professor Anant was my chair for the NPTEL coordinator. He was the founder. NPTEL, I was one of the, what you call, coordinators, but he was the man behind the whole of NPTEL in India. So the joke goes like this, that he went as a graduate student to a parish church, to a church to listen to uh, the sermon given by the priest. And then at the end of the pre-sermon, everybody left. He went to the priest and told him, Father, you gave a very nice uh, one-hour congregation. Uh, you rest, said everything, but you said everything seven times. So the father was a little bit worried. He says, why, how do you know? He said, well, I'm a graduate student. I mean, I either take notes or I listen to, I give lectures. I saw these are the things you said, only these ideas, but you repeat it seven times. Then the father says, gee, that's very nice because in the school of parishes where I get training, my trainers tell me only one seventh of the congregation will be listening to you at any time. <laughs> okay. Not here. Everybody is listening. Okay? I don't have any problem with that. <laughs> Everybody is listening all the time. What is important is repetition. And also, repetition is not who is repeating. Repetition is on what is being repeated. The message transcends the messenger. Please understand. And therefore, the message is important. Therefore, your expertise 
and your erudition in teaching and learning is the most fundamental requirement and everything else can be built around it. That's the whole uh, essence of our uh, learning process. We do this, of course, in the standard uh, learning management systems. Many of you would be using uh, Moodle or any other learning management system, put your lecture material and then the students will access them so you can organize them according to, to the way you want to organize the credits. And uh, a simple knowledge, I'm sure many of you know, a simple knowledge about a credit is one credit is technically considered to be a three-hour learning process okay, in the older system. And therefore, when you say three-credit course, you will give three lectures, but the students will need additional six lectures to do everything else, learning, assignment, etc. So it is supposed to be the student is supposed to spend nine hours. And if the students come back and tell you that they are learning so much, the college is very busy, they are not able to find time, etc., you ask them to sit down and give them this one little analysis that I give all my BTEC students the very first year and my MSc students. I tell them that you are in the class in this institute five days, seven hours a week. That's all, 35 hours. And assuming that you have to read another 70 hours, the total education time that you have to spend is 105 hours. The total clock time you have is 168 hours, seven days. Counting that you sleep for eight hours a day and you spend three hours a day for all your personal requirements, eating, everything, etc., you still are left with another 10 hours. So don't tell me that you don't have the time. You can take two more courses in addition to this. After that, the students don't come to me. They don't come and ask me saying, that's how you are teaching a lot. They say, teach whatever you teach, we'll do. <laughs> okay. The point is, justify what you do and tell the students how to learn what to learn, give them an argument, they will come back. All of these things are about the design and the way you conduct these courses. And also it is important that the first line, the second line is what you saw in the andragogical table, is a teacher is to facilitate the learner to learn just in time, not always when you teach. I teach at nine o'clock in the morning the students are not ready until 11 o'clock the previous night to the examination when they want to learn. But then they should have the access to the material. They should remember that this was taught. They should, so just in time when they want to learn. So technologies today allow you to retrieve and to retain. And also the danger is that it retrieves everything you say. Therefore, you cannot escape by saying you copied it wrong. <laughs> you cannot do that because your video will say exactly what you said. So. Understand your learning uh, and teaching methods, your teaching methods as I see it is to tell the students how to learn better rather than how much to learn. Okay? And the assessment is an important component but that's not the only deterministic component. Please remember people who have failed in the examinations or those who have nearly failed in the examinations later went on to win the Nobel Prizes in the same area. Heisenberg was a very famous example. Heisenberg nearly failed his PhD thesis. Arnold Sommerfeld protected him in passing Heisenberg from the PhD. The problem was the experimental physicist said he's no good for physics. Therefore, Heisenberg lost the international European scholarship that he could get, but he still got the degree. And about only 10 years later, he won the Nobel Prize. Okay? So it is not necessary. Examination is an important component, but it's not the deterministic component. And learning and learning to learn is the more important or the more important outcomes of any course program that you credit. And I'm sure if you do not know this table, please refer to Wikipedia. This is there when you type Wikipedia and Bloom's taxonomy. This picture comes out very beautifully and very nicely artistically drawn. Hexagon and the six items that you have, I have put it in larger letters in terms of knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis and evaluation. These are the focus points of any teaching learning process and it's not possible for us to have all six components incorporated in any learning. We may have to do two or three components at the most and the fourth and fifth components are important in higher studies, particularly in PG and research domain. Okay? Now exactly what do these things mean? You can see what is meant by knowledge. 
information, essentially. Knowledge here refers to information and the ability to retrieve the information, recall the information. So you can see, everything here is not about your understanding, is about your memory. Everything is about your memory. Select, list, name, define, describe, memorize, label, identify, locate, recite, state, recognize. Everything is memory based. So recall, that's the knowledge component. Okay. Second, comprehension. Now you are talking. You are asking the students to do a little bit of thinking. <laughs> okay. You give some things and then ask them to match something, x to y. They have to think. So the second component of comprehension is matching. Ask the students to state the same thing in his or her own words. They will be in trouble. Okay. So those things are important. So this is the next level in the cognitive ability of the student to understand things. This is the next level. Paraphrase, rewrite, give examples, express, illustrate, explain, defend, distinguish, summarize, interrelate, interpret, extend. Okay, if you think that these are new, no, these are not. All I did was this diagram was too small and you could not read all those things in that. So I have just made them into six slides. Okay. So the same thing here. Application is where we normally stop. Compre organize, generalize, dramatize, prepare, produce, choose, sketch, apply. Application, apply. Apply the principle to solving a certain problem. So these are things that you need to con at concentrate and at our undergraduate and postgraduate level, we stop at this level. We do not go beyond this. Okay? The fourth level, fifth level are essentially cognitive enhancement. Compare, differentiate, most important. Differentiate between what is learned and what is seen. Analyze them. And you see that these are all what are called the action verbs in the language of uh, educational taxonomy. These are action verbs which have been listed in the Bloom's taxonomy, the revised edition in 2001. And Bloom published the first book in 1953. Very old. Okay? The taxonomy of learning was a very famous thing. Okay. And fourth is synthesis, is where now the innovative component of the individuals come. You start original ideas, you start hypothesizing, you start developing your own based on what you learned, you design things based on what you have learned, and these now require your mental input. They no longer are based on what you have just learned. Now, your cognitive ability is to important for doing all these activities. And the evaluation, I, let me go to the last one. Yeah, last one is the evaluation. This is where everything now formally summarizes to development, novel prizes, discoveries, and industrial products, COVID uh, uh, medicine, if you want, related, I mean, very recent one, the Vaccines for COVID, the vac vaccine for COVID does not work like a vaccine for tuberculosis and other things that we had earlier. Because in those days, they used to actually put those viruses into the body in small doses and see that the body reacts to it. And then the uh, white cells remember and the system remembers that when this kind of cells come in, I should generate these antibodies. That was the old concept of vaccine. Antibodies were enabled to be created in the body with the actual diluted version of the virus or the bacteria. COVID vaccine is a very different phenomenon. It's not related to that. If anybody knew that you got one of those COVID viruses in and you put it into your body, they will sue you for billion dollars. <laughs> That's not what is done. So today, we have knowledge creation. All these things follow the lost domain, what is called the evaluation domain. Okay? Now, Assessment types, this is just a recommendation. I don't say everybody should follow it. You follow the class sizes, and if it's a large class, more than 50 students, taxonomy level 1 and 2 is sufficient because you are not in a position to individually evaluate them. So this is basically a lower level, first level course, where you want the students to understand, like the high school students remembering all the facts, and then coming in, you know, Tamil school, when I was studying in Tamil school, there will be students who will come and say all the 100, 1,000, 330, 1330, they will recite. If I ask them for the meaning of any one of them, they say, ask the teacher. <laughs> okay. That's not the learning process. But the point is, so large classes, usually for an introductory subject, one level, two level taxonomy is sufficient. 
medium sized classes that you have, your BSc or your BTEC or MSc classes, you can go up to level 3 or even 4. By the time you go to research methodology, it is important to start at level 4, not end at level 4. Because they are supposed to have taken care of the facts themselves. You don't have to verify that they know the facts or not. Don't ever interview a faculty for a basic concept he or she did not know. Please avoid interviewing them. Ask them on what they have been doing. If they go to the students, the students will anyway kill them later. Okay? If they don't understand the basic concepts. Therefore, they will learn it. It's not that I understood everything, everything I teach in quantum mechanics, quantum course and group theory. It's not that I understood before I came as a faculty. I learned them over the next 25, 28 years based on the students' requirements. But for the PhD level, it is important for students to know before they come. Encourage them to go to the level 4 and 5 and 6. That's where the discoveries come in. Okay? So the, and this is another topic because of lack of time. I will run this away. Run, later, I'll talk about it. The flip class model, I'll talk about it later. But let me come to the conclusion. Only two slides. Teaching is a short duration delivery. You deliver once, okay? One, one lecture once. You don't deliver one lecture five times for the students. Learning is a lifelong experience. The classroom, therefore, is to be made on demand for the students when they want to learn. The teaching material is already there. Assess quite regularly so that you also know that the students are picking up. Let most of them be self-assessment. Tell the students to assess themselves by helping them with questions. Tell them to learn from the next. The peer group is much better to learn from each other than the teacher-student group. This is a directed group. The students are more comfortable asking fellow students. So create peer groups in your system when you teach them. And summative assessments may be a fraction towards the end of the course, 40% or 50%, 30%, whatever. Okay? And now this is the last but one slide. Our universities are so engrossed today. How many of you have seen this quote? I'm happy. No, nobody has seen it. <laughs> Therefore, the next slide is important. Our universities are so engrossed today with the task of the, conducting the examinations and with the innumerable meetings of boards and faculties, courts and councils, senates and syndicates, that they have no time to perform the highest function of a university which is to stimulate intellectual activity and advanced knowledge. Okay. Does it sound familiar to many of you? Quite long ago, Sir C. V. Raman said this in 1927 when he gave the BHU convocation <laughs> address. Okay. Anyway, that's a negative note. So what is the positive note of this lecture? Arabindo, that's a positive note. There are three principles of education that any credit system, any education system will have to pay attention to. This was done before Bloom's Taxonomy and uh, uh, Dave Malcolm Knowles papers all came. First one, nothing can be taught. So simple. <laughs> the teacher is a facilitator. The teacher is a helper. The teacher is an enabler. It is the students who have to learn. The second principle, the mind has to be consulted in its own growth. Let the students practice the profession of their interest, not practice a profession in which they don't have interest because they have to do something else. Originality doesn't come in. Enable the students to practice what they have to. The mind has to grow in its own growth, which means what you are liking. And the third is the most important today to work from the near to the far from that which is my 11 standard student or 10 standard students to that which shall be maybe a Nobel laureate, maybe a philosopher, maybe a, somebody who will change the whole world. That's the principle of any learning system, any credit management system, any credit creation system, and any knowledge accumulation system to that which shall be the future is defined. When the two Google founders were sitting in the classroom of this Indian professor, I leave the names out, okay? They were only interested in one search algorithm which will do such much more 
comfortably and much more directly than the Yahoo and other such algorithms which were there. This is 1996. Okay. And these two students, PhD students in Stanford University, sat with this professor and they devised a new algorithm and founded a company which was supposed to be a Google company, G-O-O-G-O-L company, but by an accidental typographic error, it became a Google company. <laughs> okay. Google is a number in mathematics which is 10 raised to 100. That's a number. That's the definition of Google. And that number, to tell you, internet will have billions and billions and billions of things to search and therefore they will come up with an algorithm that can handle as big as 10 raised to 100. In Tamil and in Sanskrit, of course, we have similar things. Some of you follow Tamil. Mukodi Devarhil is not 33 crore devas. It is 10 raised to 33, 10 raised to 33, it is like 10 raised to an Avogadro number, if you know what an Avogadro number means, 10 to the 23, numbers which cannot be imagined. That was the idea, to work from that which is today to that which shall be. 25 years ago, internet was not there. Now we are stuck with it. So now this is that which is, and we have to see what that which will be another 25 years from now. I'm sure all of you will help you, help the students in this. And I want to thank you all very much for listening to me. Okay? I'll be very happy to interact with you. I'm here for the rest of the day. So please feel free at any point of time to ask questions. Yeah. Any questions or any comment? Please feel free. Yeah, please. Good morning, sir. Uh, it's my honor uh, and privilege to uh, listen to your lecture, yeah. sir. No, no, I held you. Thank you. No, I'm okay. Oh, mobile, yeah. 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 Oh, either. Yeah. No, no, I'll give you the mobile later. Mobile is here. Yeah, just one moment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's my privilege and honor to come here and to see and watch no. your uh, very valuable words. I'm Dr. P. V. Radhika, sir, from uh, Andhra Pradesh. Actually, um, uh, I have. I'm a psychologist also, sir. So the last in the last slide, you you taught that. Uh, so what is uh, in the mind of the student, they should follow that. No, you have to enable it. What it means is that facilitate what yeah. the student has yeah. a talent on. There, the point here is yeah. uh, we are finding some cases yeah. where uh, students are not able to decide uh, which course, I mean, I'm talking about the graduate level students, yeah. where they have to go further for PG, like where, what uh, stream they have to go for, yeah. and they are in a messy situation, yeah. one point, yeah. and second point is the uh, domestic problems and the inter intermittent, um, in, uh, what do you call, interference of the parents, yeah. their difficulties, and all these <laughs> things play a very dominant role in uh, deciding the future career of the students. But the student yeah. is a very intelligent one. He can decide himself if he is uh, given some counseling or if he is taught that you are uh, someone very, uh, he, he should know what he is actually. Self-awareness is very important. That's what you told. So that awareness is lacking. Uh, in today's uh, students so for that purpose we have to do I mean the education yeah. system have to do something and yeah. can you tell advise any other uh, measures to no, uh, this, is, us? this is what you are addressing is not just an educational problem but it's also a social problem yes the very mild and you know, jovial answer is that if you don't like what you do do sorry if you don't do what you like if you if you if you don't do what you like, you learn to like what you do. Yes. <laughs> okay, the other yes. way around. Yes, yes. So that's one. The second is the parental influence is very important to your point. At the end of the day, the parents are with the children much longer and the parents also have a genetical affiliation with the students' abilities. They may have a better judgment. It is the teacher who is supposed to find this judgment and make this judgment at the school level and tell the parents that your child is this, your child is good at this, this, that, etc. But this is not happening in our school system. 
Therefore, this process of what needs to be decided at a much elementary, more elementary level yes. is getting transferred to you at the college level. That's all there is. That's one, diff one problem. The second is a confused student is sometimes better than a student who has a clear decision making and the decision is wrong. It's if, if the decision is wrong. So, and second, you can always tell the student today, unlike our lives, I mean, I'm 66 now, I had only one career in my life, which is the career of a teacher and a researcher. All my life, I was researcher. In fact, my grandma is supposed to have told me, this is another joke I tell everybody, my grandma is supposed to have cursed me when I was three years old, uh, among all the 50 grandchildren that she had, that she will drop me in the school and by the time she comes back home, I will come back behind her and say, Mom, pa party, I have come back. And she said, you will be always in school. That's what she said. Look at where I am. 66 years yes. I'm in school. So yeah, our, what is important for us is we had one career. Today's children don't have one career. Yes. They will not have one career. Therefore, mistakes can be made without knowing that they are mistakes. If you know that it's a mistake, don't make it. But take a chance. Today's network, today's system, educational system, today's what is available on the world is flat, allows everyone to flourish the way he or she wants if they are determined. And if they don't see that they are not able to do within two or three years, if they fail, failure is not a, sec sig I mean, rec failure is not a sign of the incapacity of the individual. Failure is a sign of the route that you took was not correct. So this is not a solvable problem. Parental guidance is important. We tell the parents, you know, your problem is the most severe problem for us in IIT, JE counseling. The student will come and say, IIT Madras computer science course, is it better than, uh, sorry, IIT Madras aerospace engineering course, is it better than IIT Roorkee computer science course? How can I, I mean, how can I answer this question? I say, I ask them, what does your boy want? No, 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 he doesn't know. I'm, I have to tell him. I said, get away. Let me talk to the student. Let me talk to the boy. And then we do the advice. But this is a constant professional advice that you have to give. It is not a social problem you can solve. We are not mature enough to tell our children to do what they want and what they like and support them for what they want to do because we have other constraints like financial constraints, social constraints, and then the egos, many other factors come in. Within that, you have to walk carefully. That's all I can. I mean, there is no solution that I know. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, one, one question. Yes. Anyway, sir answered yes. many of the questions. Yes. Sir, you said that financial and social and unsolvable situation of the condition. But uh, if you see that financial and other thing, we see that this uh, workshop also conducted by the IOE. And recently we got almost all the faculty, University of Hyderabad, 50 IOE projects with the funded, we got it. But uh, faculty alone cannot do the yeah. research and other thing. Yeah. Students' participation is necessary. And the system is uh, such a way that we may not able to force the students and encourage them. And if they are not trained in the proper way in the academic institution, they are not able to cope up with the industry. Yeah. So that is the reason, even though India is having a great resource in this thing, still people are saying that unemployment. So once they are higher education and other thing, education always leads to the employment. They can earn the money kind of thing. Yeah. But the students or maybe who are seeking for the employment, they want immediately the high income kind of thing. And if we see most of 60 plus or 50 plus people are trying to educate them, they will say that you people are not unsuccessful kind of thing. Yeah. They, they comment this way. You, and you, don't we, know what I, you don't know what I said to my father. <laughs> okay. If my child tells me, if my son tells me, Appa, you don't know, I, you have no problem, or older people, younger people tell you, you have to slightly remember what you said to me. You know, I chose chemistry not because I liked chemistry or whatever it is. My father said, you take chemistry because my brother, my elder son is already doing mathematics and my other nephew is doing physics. I don't want another one. You do chemistry. Simple. <laughs> my life was decided in one life. But the problem is what you are saying is right. So can we all do? No, certain no. method or something no, that is no to work out. That so then no we, we never achieve our goal uh, succeeding of 
initiating any of workshops and these things if we could not solve that thing. No, that is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with you on that. Every workshop turns a few stones away out mm. into a new program. Therefore, in my view, rather than saying that this workshop is not producing enough outcomes, you may have to find a means of multiplicating this workshop in multiple domains so that people are, people are aware of what they are supposed to be aware of. So awareness is the first thing that you have to create, even among the students. See, I have students, my Tamil student, I had a PhD student who was not able to speak a few words in English together. So he never talked talk to me for more than three, four years. And one day I found out, why are you doing this? He said, sir, you are speaking in English. I'm not able to speak. I don't know. I said, I'm, I'm just repeating the conversation. And the equation, mathematics, eh, that has no language. Write whatever you want. Speak whatever you want in Tamil. I understand Tamil. Let's speak. Sir, our thesis, what do I do? Hey, Baba, English is not our mother tongue. Yes, sir. We agree. Let's not, <laughs> let's not worry about it. I know today if I speak English and you think that I'm speaking well, please remember 45 years is behind it. True. Training. Communication is training. Cognition is not training. Cognition is native. I think we should worry about cognitive abilities to be stimulated in the individuals long before they are able to communicate. These workshops should also keep those things in mind. So my, my feeling is you are, the problem that your state is very genuine, but as I said, if a problem, if you cannot cut the stone in one stroke, do you give up if you want the stone to be no. cut in pieces? Exactly the same thing. <laughs> we exactly. teachers never give up, yeah. sir. Exactly. Thank you for opportunity, sir. Thank you. You have given solution also in your Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. We will have a break for uh, tea and... Uh, 10 minutes break, we will reassemble uh, immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for a wonderful uh, insight of uh, your talk. I request all participants to give a big clap to Professor Mangal Sundaram. Thank you very much. Yeah, he is not only representing UGC, but also as an individual. Uh, he was involved from day one in the process of implementation of NEP. Then we have requested uh, Professor Jagdish Kumar, Chairman UGC, to go over here to participate in this program. He was very happily nominating Dr. Gopu Kumar, saying that he will be there to represent UGC. So I welcome Dr. Gopu Kumar, Joint Secretary from University Grants Commission. He joined UGC almost two decades back, and uh, I can tell you he is one of the finest officers of UGC. Uh, because I do not know how many of you visit and uh, interact with them. Uh, he is one such person who is very uh, teacher friendly and uh, university friendly. Prior to that, he was a teacher in uh, biology from Madurai Kamaraj University. So with this uh, background, he joined, and uh, today he is in um, UGC as one of the senior most uh, members and uh, I thank Dr. Gopu Kumaru for uh, going over here to be with us and uh, share the UGC perspective of what exactly the uh, ideology that has gone in while they were framing uh, curricular framework for this uh, process. Thank you sir, thank you for joining us, please. I would like to uh, thank respected Vice Chancellor and uh, Professor Narasimuluji for inviting um, sending invite to, to UGC and also I thank Chairman UGC for nominating me for this program and uh, respected resource persons and distinguished participants, good afternoon to you all. I will be making briefly a presentation on credit curriculum and qualifications framework. Some of the documents recently developed by UGC to enable a flexible education. I have worked as a coordinator with these expert committees in UGC. I am not an expert in these subjects, but my experience in working with these committees as a coordinator from the sidelines uh, helped me in getting some uh, in, um, uh, information and that's I am interested in sharing with you all. Some of the major policy decisions of 
National Education Policy 2020 is multidisciplinary, holistic education, flexible education, and integration of general education with vocational education. So, some of the documents which helped or which propels the flexible and multidisciplinary education, uh, some documents UGC has already developed and few more documents are in the pipeline. Uh, the national credit framework is one such and the national higher education qualifications framework, curriculum and credit framework for undergraduate programs, multiple entry, multiple exits in academic programs and academic bank of credits. These are some of the tools which enables flexible education and out of this I will be sharing um, uh, some thoughts about these three documents like national credit framework, national higher education qualification framework and curriculum and credit framework for undergraduate program. So these are the three documents. This is the middle curriculum and credit framework for undergraduate programs UGC has already published and it is in the um, uh, UGC website and we have also shared with all universities to implement this um, the curriculum and credit structure for undergraduate programs and the national credit framework as you can see the, from the symbols above all these organizations are involved in the developing this national credit framework UGC, AACT, National Council for Vocational Education and Training these three organizations are main players apart from that Department of Higher Education, School Education from the Ministry of Education and the NIOS, NCERT, NCT, many organizations involved in the development of national credit framework and this is considered as the principal document covering the credit structure right from the school education to higher education. And based on that UGC has developed a national higher education qualifications framework this was uh, put in the public domain seeking opinions from all uh, stakeholders and that is in the final stages. We are just waiting for national credit framework to come out first be being the uh, principal document and immediately this document will be out. So national credit framework this is basically a comprehensive document which enables integration of academic learning, vocational learning and experiential learning right from school education to higher education. So this mobility and flexible education, the, the principal uh, the factor helping all these flexible education and mobility is equivalence. If there are equivalence between two programs or two institutions uh, or two qualifications then only there will be possibility of flexible to move from one program to another or from one institution to another. So this equivalence will be established uh, only when the degrees are um, defined on the basis of learning outcomes. What a student, a student is supposed to acquire at the end of um, uh, obtaining the degree. So that is uh, called as learning outcomes and once these qualifications are framed based on the learning outcomes automatically there is a as to a certain extent there will be some equivalence will be established. So this is the basic connecting point uh, for this flexible education. So based on that the committee which worked on the national cre uh, credit framework they uh, broadly assigned these four um, uh, parameters. They made it as an equivalent one right from school education to higher education it should be common like learning hours here I have mentioned only 12, uh, 1200 hours per year for higher education for, from, for school education the early stages it is 800 hours per year and the number of credits is 40 per year and levels starting from 4.5 to level 8 this is for higher education and the level 1 to 4 is for the school education and credit points is 180 to 320 for the higher education the, uh, the credit points below 180 is for the assigned for the school education. So these are broadly the parameters the national credit framework standardized and based on these parameters only the national higher education qualification framework and uh, the curriculum and credit framework for UG programs were developed. So the national credit framework as for the skill courses and the regular academic program there are already for we have this national higher education qualifications framework and for the skill education we have national skill qualifications framework you all know. So for uh, experiential learning how to integrate with it. So this is a 
short table which explains the weightage assigned to experiential learning. So for example, the experience after attaining some degree, if somebody works in some company or um, uh, industry, they will be assigned based on, uh, on obtaining a degree, the person will be called as a trained person. And after um, uh, attaining some experience, proficient, expert and masters. So this is basically classified between point 0.1 to point 0.2. And this is 1.33 and 1.67 is, um, uh, this is 1 divided by 3.33 it will come. Accordingly, they have um, uh, assigned the score. So this is the weightage. 1, 1.33, 1.67 and 2. Accordingly, any, um, uh, the, for example, the credit point is usually calculated by multiplying the level of education with the credits. So the, the point we get, if we multiply it with this weightage, that will give the, the credit for the experience. So this is the basic table to how to integrate the experience earned by a student into the credit system. And this is the full picture of the national credit framework starting from the school education to higher education. And uh, you can see for preschool three years, the first two five years are considered as foundational program and next three preparatory stage and middle and secondary and senior secondary. Senior secondary. So you can see the levels, four point up to four is the school education starting from 0 0.1 and uh, for the up to preparatory stage it is level 1 and up to middle stage it is level 2 and up to secondary stage it is level 3 and senior secondary it is level 4. And uh, as you can see the credits 40 hours um, uh, per year and 20 credits per semester. This is the minimum uh, credit structure uh, prescribed in these frameworks. And for uh, we have seen that 800 uh, for the foundational uh, stage, it is 800 hours per year. So 800 hours per year uh, uh, for uh, 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 40, 40, 40 credits, it will give roughly 27, 27 um, uh, the credits earned in a year. And that 27, uh, it is since it is for three years in preschool, 27 into three. So when this multiplied with the credits uh, the levels, that will give the credit points. Throughout these credit points, it is the multiplication of credits earned in a year with the level. So as we have seen, it is up to four school education and from higher education, uh, 4.5, 5, 5.5, 6, 6.5, 7 and 8. These are the levels prescribed in the national credit framework uh, for the entire education system starting from school to higher education. So next we come to the National Higher Education Qualifications Framework. This document has been developed by UGC. In the higher education system, there are many qualifications which differ in terms of content, nomenclature and duration. For example, we have in undergraduate program, one year BA, two year BA, three year degree programs, four year degree program and five year also. So it is difficult to bring equivalence with these kind of variations. So, as I already mentioned, these qualifications are going to be defined on the basis of learning outcomes. So, based on the learning outcomes, all these qualifications will be grouped. Any, quali any learning outcome, any degree program which comes falls under a particular learning program will be automatically grouped under that particular level. So, this national higher education quali qualification framework is basically ranges all the uh, qualifications in the higher education based on the uh, learning outcomes starting from 4.5 to level 8. So this will help in equivalence, establishing equivalence of certificates, diploma and degree. And this will also help to understand the competencies. For example, learning outcomes, as I mentioned in the beginning itself, it is, uh, it is defined as a, what a student should know at the end of obtaining a degree. So as a result of which, the employer will be knowing if a particular person has got a degree, and the employer will automatically know these are the competencies, these are the um, uh, special skills this particular person might have obtained because he has uh, acquired this degree. So that helps in the uh, understand the competencies, competencies expected of a qualification and based on that mobility is also enabled. 
So National Higher Education Qualifications Framework found a very important place in the National Education Policy 2020. The NEP 2020 says there will be a National Higher Education Qualifications Framework which will describe the learning outcomes for a certificate, diploma and degree programs. This will in turn facilitate credit transfer equivalence by ensuring autonomy to higher education within a broad framework of higher education qualifications. So the objective and principle of NHGKF, the objective is to harmonize all the higher education qualification by converging, uh, higher education system by converging different systems of qualification into a common framework. And the fundamental premise, as I explained, is going to be the learning outcomes, which connects all these uh, qualifications. Qualifications are synchronized in a series of level based on learning outcomes, starting from 4.5 to 8. It comprises seven levels, and the higher education qualifications are arranged uh, 4.5 to 8. And these levels, the, at the level 4.5, the complexity of learning will be uh, little on a lesser side. And as it moves from higher levels, the complexity of the difficulty level increases. This is the basic concept. This is more or like, uh, like uh, questions are mentioned in the morning on the lines of Bloom's ta taxonomy. Uh, remembering, uh, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. These are the six levels of uh, the Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy. And based on that, to a large extent, our higher education qualification frameworks also, uh, we have, uh, the committee had arranged the qualifications uh, by increasing the, uh, the difficulties. Uh, by with every stage. So first, the National Higher Education Qualification Framework talks about the, the larger graduate attributes, what a graduate should achieve after getting a particular degree. To widen the current knowledge base and skills, gaining and applying new knowledge and skills, undertaking future studies independently performing well in a chosen career, and playing a constructive role as a citizen. So these are uh, basically uh, on the basis of the objectives of NEB 2020, these graduate attributes were framed in the NHQF. So based on these graduate attributes, there are certain, yeah. Forward only after <laughs> this side, okay. Yeah. Ah. Yes. So these are the key elements to acquire the graduate attributes. This is what I mentioned in the more or less like uh, Bloom's taxonomy levels, like knowledge and understanding and skills required to perform and accomplish a task, and the application of knowledge and skill, generic learning, constitutional humanistic ethical and moral values, employment ready skills and entrepreneurship skills and mindset. These are the various elements, the basic elements to prescribe the graduate attributes and for each level, what are the things one should acquire on these six elements is prescribed in the qualification framework and that keeps on increasing in the difficulty as uh, a student moves on from one level to the higher level. So how it, the difficulty level increases, that we'll see in the next slide. For example, we take the second one, skills required to perform and accomplish uh, tasks. So for this particular thing, and this is the element, as I mentioned, the element skills required to perform and accomplish tasks. And at the level of 4.5, the requirement is cognitive skills to analyze information. And at level five, cognitive and technical skills to analyze information and at level 5.5, cognitive and technical skills to evaluate and analyze complex ideas, and six, cognitive and technical skills relating to the research methods and techniques, and level 6.7, advanced cognitive and technical skills for conducting research, and level 6.7 are both the same, which I will come at the end of the, uh, the PPT, I will explain the reason for this, and at level 8, Cognitive and technical skills for conceptualizing, designing, and implementing research to generate original knowledge. So these are the, um, uh, the, the, the difficulty levels, as you can see. It increases from one level to another on this particular element. Similarly, 
Similarly, for all those six elements, uh, the NHEQ of documents prescribe how the difficulty level increases from one level to another. And uh, this is a broad framework for all qualifications and based on that, UGC has already developed the um, uh, curriculum and credit framework for undergraduate program that will come in the next uh, uh, phase. And based on that framework, now institution should, uh, UGC will make a, a model curriculum for discipline specific and institutions will develop according to their requirements. This is the basic idea for the entire qualification framework and credit and curriculum structure. So this table gives an information on the qualification type and credit requirement. As I mentioned, uh, the NHQ level Okay. Yeah, this is for uh, the for skills we have given that difficulty levels like that for all these six elements, uh, how the difficulty level increases from one level to the next level, it is given clearly in the documents. And this table gives the levels and qualification time and nomenclature and the minimum credits required. As we mentioned that 40 is the minimum credit prescribed for uh, degree programs in a year. And the universities have the liberty to increase also. This is only the minimum. Level 4.5 is the, and you may be aware that the multiple entry and multiple exit uh, based on the national education policy which gives the freedom, for example, if any student for some compelling reasons has to exit at the end of first year, they will be given an undergraduate certificate. This is not any certificate which will be uh, considered as an undergraduate certificate because this is part of the UG program. So this will be different. So at, at any student who exits at the end of the first year will be getting an undergraduate certificate and based on that, later on, two years, three years later, if the student wants to come back, they can continue their studies from where they have actually left. So they can start from under uh, second year. And if somebody leaves at the end of the second year, they will be given undergraduate diploma. And uh, at the end of uh, the uh, second year and first year, there is a provision to provide some skill or vocational courses for minimum four credits. And that will also help them in getting some employment also. So third one is 5.5 is the bachelor's degree program and level 5.5 is the bachelor of um, occasion, BVOC. Uh, here also I have just uh, kept it separately because this is gen general uh, bachelor's education and 5.5, both are same only, is for BVOC. And this is level 6, bachelor's degree program and this is for four years and eight semester and master's degree those who are complete four year program they will undergo a one year um, uh, master program and those who complete a three year master undergraduate program they will be completing a two years master's program and you can see level 6.5 is the master's program and level 7 we have kept MTech, ME and all technical programs at level 7. Because during the discussion with the, uh, with the expert committee, we, the committee had a meeting with the ACT also. They felt that the technical programs cannot be compressed to one year masters. So masters will remain two years in uh, technical programs irrespective of um, they are completing a four year undergraduate program. So that is the re reason. Even though masters programs were grouped under level 6.5, these technical programs has been kept under level 7. And finally, doctoral program is level 8. Yeah. This is the, the, the summary of the entire national credit, uh, national qualification framework, uh, level starting from level 4.5 to 8. And you can see 6.5 and 7 both are masters, but at different level for the reasons I, I briefed already. 
and 4.5 and 5 in these two levels there is an exit for credit skill based courses and these courses need to be accredited by national council for vocational education and training and the third year degree at 5.5 and four year undergraduate program in the four year undergraduate program there are two programs one is four year undergraduate program with honors and the uh, next one is honors with research and for re-entry there is a minimum duration given in the academic bank of credits for seven years if any student joins back after exiting within seven years they can uh, continue automatically beyond seven years the lateral end will be based on a validation of prior learning outcomes and finally uh, the curriculum and credit framework for undergraduate programs so based on taking into consideration all the major recommendations of uh, NEP 2020 this framework has been uh, developed by UGC for the undergraduate program so for example NEP 2020 says all students should be exposed to all disciplines in the undergraduate program in addition to that they will be getting specialized in one or two majors also so this was the uh, the basic idea the committee took into while developing this program and this is the structure of UG program uh, the developed by the UGC for, uh, for the four year undergraduate program as you can see this is semester one. Uh, one. This is specific courses, one major, one minor, one interdisciplinary, and ability enhancement, and skill enhancement, and common value added courses. So one major, one minor, and one interdisciplinary, three subjects, uh, um, or a student. Actually, a student can take one major and two minors. So accordingly, two minors. 2 plus 1 major 3 and 1 4 um, disciplines a student will explore in the first year at the end of the first year students will have an option whether to retain the same major and minor or they have an option to change that also so this is a major uh, flexibility given to the students in this new undergraduate program and those who exit at the end of the uh, first year uh, the 4 year uh, four, 4 credits vocational education uh, will be offered and similarly third and fourth uh, semesters same type of uh, uh, structure and uh, fifth and sixth internship there is a compulsory internship engrossed in this uh, structure then fourth year this is for fourth year and the four year UG honors and the this is for the four year UG research honors with research so you can uh, see the difference the harness with the research students will be undertaking a research project dissertation uh, others will be awarded UG degree with harness and the four both the UG honors and UG harness with research are eligible to uh, take admission in PhD also directly without undergoing a master's program the the new the revised regulation for award of PhD recently in the December 22 UGC has notified that uh, gives the flexibility for students after completing a four year undergraduate program they can if they um, uh, if they want they can move to PhD program so these are the three major documents I want to, uh, to share with you the national credit framework national higher education qualification framework and the um, uh, curriculum and credit framework for undergraduate programs thank you thank you so much
Good afternoon, sir. Uh, we are from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Six credit course or something like that in it says uh, skill based courses so will there is a slight confusion in these two descriptions number one and the second point where we would require clarification is the number of credits at the end of the first year is 40 if you if I remember correctly page number 27 of the curriculum framework lists out the number of credits required under each discipline like if you're thinking of a three-year degree then 80 credits core credits and 24 minor then you have multidisciplinary 9 SCC 9 and so on and for the internship it says two to four credits and the total given at the end of a three-year degree program is 120 and for a four-year it is 160. So the understanding is internship is already built into those 120 credits. Whereas the one which you showed just now where the levels are specified lists the internship oblique uh, uh, apprenticeship separately along with a skill-based course. Can you please clarify this? Hello? Yeah. Madam, that 10 credit ex exit course you are referring to that was the draft document placed in the public domain initially. And based on that, we received a lot of uh, inputs from stakeholders saying that 10 years, uh, 10 credits within two months, it is on a higher side. So we have kept as four credits as a minimum, and it is for up to the institutions to uh, prescribe the number of credits for the exit uh, uh, courses. Okay, that is one thing. And second thing is, you have mentioned about the uh, two to four credits for internship. This is also, we are kept initially for uh, two credits only. 
and based on inputs, uh, again, many experts felt two credits for internship is very less. It should be uh, four. And that is the reason we have kept two to four. By keeping two, the total credits will come to 120 for three years and 160 for four year program. So this is the range we have given for internship two to four. And regarding internship slash apprenticeship slash skill courses, the uh, flexibilities with the institutions, what to uh, offer and how to offer. Which one, madam, the exit, exit credit? Yeah, exit credit you are referring to? Exit is outside the exit is outside the credit structure. Almost the last one, yeah, the levels. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is something which we are trying to understand. If you look at the total number of credits at the end of first year, it is 40. Yeah. And the uh, description in italics says students exiting the program after securing 40 credits will be awarded UG certificate in the relevant discipline, etc. Uh, provided they secure four credits in work-based vocational courses, which we understand to be the internship. Yeah. So is the internship again a part of those 40 or is it 40 plus four? That's one question. And then uh, the next one is in addition to six credits from skill-based courses. So will it be 40 plus 10 for those who exit or is it 36 credits in the disciplines plus four credits for internship plus another six credits for a skill-based course? That is a little confusing. Yeah. And in the second uh, one where somebody wants to exit, one second, sir, let me finish my question. In the second one where uh, after two years, if somebody wants to exit, 80 credits, but here it says four credits in skill-based vocational courses. Uh, please clarify these yes, doubts, sir. These four and six. So if you could give us the total number of credits at the end of year one and at the end of year two, whether 40 is inclusive of internship or is it 40 plus four plus six? Inclusive. Madam, these four and six at the end of first year and the four at the end of second year are outside the credit structure. These 40 credits per year. And we are given the total also, 40 at the end of four, first year and 80 at the that end of first year calculate. and 160 at the end of four-year program. Those who complete exit at after three years, they will get an undergraduate degree with 120 credits. Sir, in that case, the curriculum framework for undergraduate programs uh, I'm afraid has to mention that because in that the total 120 is inclusive of your uh, internship which is for two or four credits. No, internship is very much inside. You can see it is a part of skill enhancement courses. Whereas we have mentioned these are in the separate, uh, separate uh, column. Only those given in these minor, major, interdisciplinary ability enhancement and skill enhancement and value added courses are part of the credit structure. Sir? Yeah, yeah. My understanding, my, my understanding is that yeah. 40 is the total credit. It includes either skill based course or an internship or a dissertation. Please remember, it's a, there is an oblique in each one of them. Therefore, what it says is that your four credits should be given to one of these. And the second line, when it says four credits work-based vocational courses, please remember that is that third last from the from the last or third column. You choose your students to either go for an internship 
or you chose your students to take a skill based course in any one of them or you asked the students to do a dissertation this is how i would have read this document instead of saying whether it is outside or inside it is actually inside the total from what he is uh, explaining yeah shall i shall i add sir please go see for acquiring a certificate after first year exit one should get four credits extra other than that 40 credits yes yes yeah it is See, exiting program is not for everybody not yeah, all yeah. students it is those who want to exit yeah. they should acquire four credits yeah. separately and for others there is in the inside the skill enhancement goes there is already yeah, the, there is a within, uh, yeah, skill enablement is within the 40 yeah within that the 40 that is within 40 yes so it is 40 plus 4 first year if you wants to exit at second year 80 plus 4 if you wants to get diploma certificate you yeah. should acquire 80 credits normal and four credits from vocational or uh, skill skill Sorry, certificate yeah. so it is 80 plus 4 they'll, they'll get a diploma in degree program yes 40 plus 4 degree certificated Certific. degree program yeah. and 120 credits normally and it is 120 for the regular degree but out of 120 there is an internship provision yes. where institution can allot four credits or six credits to that internship as a part of awarding the degree yeah no it's a it's a depending upon the project that they take up madam i told you many times internship is part of the credit structure see these the all these inter internship is part of the skill enhancement courses skill skill enhancement internship and dissertation or comes under grouped under the skill enhancement courses okay we'll discuss yeah madam one second madam model curriculum the work has started because as you know the framework for ug program has released only in uh, december 2022 now committees we have to form uh, formed already uh, for each discipline it's a huge task it has started thank you yeah yeah and you may be aware that ugc has already uh, developed the learning outcome based curriculum uh, credit structure locf and that will be revised based on the nep and this new framework good afternoon sir sir actually i am not talking about credits or everything but only thing is in andhra pradesh uh, we have a, a, a higher education so as uh, uh, we in a degree program we have to do all the skill and en enhancement courses and internship and we are doing community service project and apprenticeship three things we are doing for a graduate degree so that is one uh, at the end of first year and uh, second and third semesters we are doing the second internship and for the last uh, final year we are doing six months uh, apprenticeship program so what is happening here is sir the problem is very difficult for the students to cope up with these things because in a community service project one month uh, so, sorry for two months they have to go outside they have to do surveys everything and uh, they are losing track of the academic uh, studies that is one point and second point is in the even in the last semester fifth or sixth they have to choose the internship uh, apprenticeship program and the second problem is lack of uh, availability of the opportunities for apprenticeship in andhra pradesh where it is in rural areas we don't have internship uh, apprenticeship availabilities and the students cannot go uh, anywhere and they have given a list of so many things which are not at all useful for the students the industries names small even a small shop also is uh, given as an example one minute sir i'll close 
So for that, uh, for that, uh, I just request the UGC authorities to just make the internship because uh, graduate students are not that much, even uh, rural students I'm talking about, that much capable of taking the, the how to do the internship and how to make it possible, write the internship report. Actually, as the faculty, we are doing 50% uh, of the work. So for that, uh, I request the UGC authorities to make uh, some, uh, what do you call, modification on it and make it more uh, easy for the Students, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, madam, that uh, for internship, we already a committee is working on, and UGC is also developing a portal on the lines of AACT for internship. And these are, we understand the difficulties in uh, finding uh, internships and apprenticeships. Uh, so, for that, work is going on. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Dr. Dayanand Murthy. Uh, I am coming from the law department, actually. Uh, we have a five year integrated course. And uh, the admission is based on the national entrance exams. So is uh, exit option available for them? One. Uh, two, uh, if exit option is, it, it's an integrated course. Uh, can we say after three years, uh, he can exit and uh, we adopt the credit system there also? One thing. Second thing, uh, you said something about he can exit after two years if you want to come and join uh, back to the institution, he can join. Uh, because we are, once again, as uh, national exams are conducted for admissions, can the same person be adopted into the th second year or third year whenever he has exited? That's one thing. Uh, and the third thing is internships. We uh, Students do go for internship for 21 days normally. Uh, can university uh, grant credit on those internships which they uh, undergo during that 21 days uh, uh, period as such? So these three points, sir. Uh, where this internship you mentioned, sir? Uh, internship with lawyers, internship with judges. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. These are the things which, uh, yes, once again, yes. skill-based. They are all skill-based. Exactly. Based. It is permissible. It is given yes. in the undergraduate uh, curriculum framework also. Okay. That is there. And the other thing is integrated program, whether the exit and entry is there or re-entry is there or not. So you know the integrated program is offered in many regulatory bodies. Yes, yes. Uh, for example, the AACT, the oh. NCTE. NCTE has recently come out with this uh, five-year five integrated hmm. uh, teacher education hmm. program, hmm. ITAP. Hmm. They are of the opinion that hmm. entry exit is not possible in ITAP. Correct. Yeah. So it depends on um, uh, regulatory bodies, different okay. de regulatory because bodies. Because our bar council is the regulatory yeah, body. Yeah. They so may not permit yes, us to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. for the general education, it is possible. Okay. Okay. Fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Madam, we'll take questions. We are getting late for the yeah. Yeah, the, in the ABC document, um, uh, it is notified seven years is the shelf life of credits um, uh, you can store in the Academic Bank of Credit. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, nice uh, presentation. And may I request all the participants, please put your hands together and be a, give a big clap to Dr. Gopu Kumar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar, for being with us. And uh, I'll just. I'll just take a small time to say a few things about ABC, which is the backbone of entire uh, uh, discussion that we are uh, having. And uh, maybe here and there still we have some doubts. In fact, it is not only from my side, even UGC has some doubts. And that's why it is still uh, uh, isn't, it is in the form of a draft. So the final uh, <coughs> version will come out very soon, but uh, you can listen to the chairman UGC Professor Jagdish Kumar's uh, talk on this, uh, which is available on YouTube. We will also share in our uh, link. I would like to throw upon some light on what exactly that we can do with respect to credit transfer policy. And ABC is the gateway. ABC is the gateway where we can uh, actually get into the definitions and all these things you can find on the website and uh, I am not going to talk much about this. But the very interesting thing is everything is well 
documented even how to open an academic bank of credits. Many of the institutions have not opened their account. First one. The second thing, those institutions who have registered, they are not disclosing that to their students. Many of the students, they say that they are not aware of it. Now you can introspect yourself where you are. I am not finding fault. Please, wake up. It is time for all of us to get into action. You don't require anybody's permission to do this. Please don't say that our government, our council, our higher education council, my university, nobody will stop you in registering on the ABC portal. Share that with your students to register themselves. Every student. In fact, it is going to be a law from 23-24 academic year onwards that every institute and every student must have the registration in ABC portal. And I will share some of these things. What are the benefits that the student will get? When uh, Professor uh, Sundaram was uh, talking very nicely, the whole attempt that what are all we are talking is about the learning process. Here we are going to provide some kind of flexibility in the learning process. We were not having any idea of internship when we were students. It is something like a Greek and Latin those days. But now here is an opportunity. And the moment we talk about, because I am from a training center, many of the teachers, they say that we don't have the facility, we don't have the skill, we don't have resources. Every time this is the answer I get from 90% of the teachers. We would like to clarify this. Even though you don't have any resources, there is one resource called internet. Most of the things are available there. You only have to do is you, you allow your student to do that. That's it. The number of skill courses that are mentioned in several places by several people, you may not be having teachers to teach all the subjects. No problem. But there are n number of sites. Last week also IIM Bangalore and IGNO added uh, about half a dozen courses. Last to last week. So we should know where they are. As a teacher, your responsibility to know that what are all the resources that are available. Even we talk about uh, uh, OERs, Open Educational Resources, many teachers express their ignorance. I am sorry if I make that kind of a statement. It is true. My only request is, if you are aware of these things, you can easily guide your students. Remember, the students who are in school now at 10th standard, 11th standard, 12th standard, when they come to your college in 2025, 20, 26, they will all be knowing these things. The moment they start exercising their power through ABC, you and I will not have any answer except obliging them. Please, I'm not threatening, I'm just cautioning that we have to accept. Rather than waiting till 26, why not we start doing things from today onwards? And which is, it's not a difficult thing. You are just allowing them. Now you go with that. The, your core courses, your, uh, what do you call, electives, all that blah, 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 you can still follow. Only thing is, allow the student to exercise his flexibility. Already ABC has one amendment. When they started, they have given with 40%. Now they have amended to 50%. Up to 50% of the courses the student can pursue outside the institute. You cannot stop. And Government of India is thinking of establishing a digital university in August 2023. I will see around 25 to 30 lakh students day one. Day one. Because they will have flexibility. They need not come to college 10 to 5 or 9 to 4 strictly. 
and uh, as our uh, madam was mentioning many rural children many children who are uh, at a disadvantaged groups they can learn at their own pace slow learners whom sir was mentioning they will listen second time third time the same uh, topics and they will take the exam and they will they can also demand the exam there will be repeated uh, exams hereafter so all these possibilities and provisions are being created you cannot deny such opportunity and student can also have the mobility see for some extraneous reasons as uh, dr gopu kumar was mentioning if the student is compelled to leave at the end of the first year let him second year third year up to seven years they can complete their course and that mobility should be there the moment we talk about mobility the teachers are having all kinds of resistance and rigidity no 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 how can we allow the student who is coming from a rural college to university of hyderabad nobody asked you you just never said you take them physically they will move from one institute to another institute subject to you put the condition that their admission should have been provisional by taking an entrance exam fine they will take the exam and they will come if the student has taken already first year entrance exam you need not conduct again second year exam cuet is in place now so a student who has taken admission through cuet in first year ba he need not take second year exam again right and don't expect that all the students from adilabad will come to hyderabad how many students can afford to do that maybe a small number day when we should not have any kind of inhibition that all the students will come and join in university of hyderabad or in any institute for that matter but let there be a provision for them to access your learning resources online can you open a course from university of hyderabad to a student in adilabad can venkateswara college delhi economics courses can be accessed by a student in mizoram that is what we are expected to do that that is where people like sir they have done lot of work to create those resources and put them on the web now can we provide that kind of a mobility and freedom to choose courses the moment a college where there is no faculty to teach public finance in economics somewhere in manipur can access the contents of venkateswara college delhi he will only listen to them but he will take the exam there first of all you create that kind of an access to the student thereby we call that as equitable access in the process of learning every child of this nation should have the same access not that because i am in hyderabad i access the university of hyderabad contents whereas the children from srinagar kashmir they will never have any access to good quality of life no every child should have the same access if at all we can do that i think we will be doing a wonderful service that is the kind of benefits that are expected to provide to all the students and key features like multiple entry multiple exit here also student teachers are having too many doubts no 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 if they exit what will they they may misuse our certificate one of my colleagues was telling no 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 if we give a certificate at the end of first year he may misuse it is it possible for a student to misuse the certificate given by he, he has done his course he has earned 40 credits he will go out for some reason let them get a job if at all if somebody is giving a job let them get how does it matter we have too many what do you call apprehensions in the process please welcome that multiple entry multiple exit as it is we will see over a period of 5 years how it goes and we we can have definitely ugc will have a review about this after 5 years and any time anywhere learning and students at their own pace this is what we should think today's children as sir was mentioning 21st century children they have developed or they are having a consumers mindset this is what i read from them if they don't like this they will just get out they will not have any inhibitions to quit a particular program if they don't like 
if they are not able to do in that particular year. You must be seeing some of your kids how they are behaving at home. The same thing is happening in colleges also. So don't have too much of, uh, what do you call, expectation from this, uh, uh, what do you call, MEME, -E, multiple entry, multiple. let them do. And allow the students to do 50% of the courses as per the law. Anywhere, doesn't matter. You tell me one good reason why a student will go out and do the same course when a teacher is here. Any answer? If you are doing your job as servers, I mean, he put it in a very nice form. We only should realize what we are doing. As long as we do our job, the student will never think of going out and doing that course. But for some reason, some students may do because the, the, the courses that are there in, uh, what do you call, Swayam or NPTEL, if they are free, he may get some, uh, what do you call, fee concession in the uh, tuition fee, they, 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 he may select. Otherwise, things are good. And you can see this uh, uh, on the website. I will not go into the details. All these things are available. And in fact, the, the, the information, how it works, there is a nice video also. You can see this video. We will also share a video created by uh, the uh, local groups. We will share in the uh, uh, link that we are going to share by today evening or tomorrow. And then my earnest request, people have come from different colleges and universities. The first step you have to do when you go back, please register. Please register and send me a response by next week. This group will be alive. We will keep it alive, this WhatsApp group. We have created a WhatsApp group of all the participants. It will be there even after this program. We would like to see. We will definitely report this matter to UGC. I will take the responsibility of giving the feedback to the UGC, right? And <coughs> then you see the benefits that you are going to get. As teachers and as administrators, can we think of bringing uniform? Why I am talking about this? Still many colleges, my friend uh, Professor Subramanya will uh, uh, not agree with me. Still some people, they offer uh, some one credit course, two credit courses, uh, some audit courses in some of the universities. The choice is yours, but please, have some kind of a uniformity that you are teaching two hours, three hours, as per the definition of the credit, sir, we'll be talking about the definitions and how to design the credits in the afternoon. The point is, Madam is also talking about 40 credits, if they earn at the end of first year, can we give a certificate? The answer is yes. So how this 40 credits, you can have your own definition include your skill courses, your uh, internship, all these things, or exclude some clarification that they will provide in the final draft, in the final copy. Till such time, let us have some uniformity that still master's degree courses, some people are giving 64 credits. With 64, they are getting MA degree. So let there be uniformity, 40s, 80, 80 for postgraduate, and 120 for undergraduate, some people still they are giving degree at 108, 108. And 160, thanks to AACT, they have prescribed very well and people stick to that, right? Now, here, I, I, I request Dr. Gopakumar also, can institutes exercise, can institutes exercise 10% of the total number of credits, 160 plus, 16, 176, as additional courses. The student will have choice to take these 16 courses outside 160 also. You allow them, right? But for any reason, if the student is completing 160 without this, some of the prescribed ones, can we not give them degree? It is difficult, I know. Think about this. This is a question from my side. I, I, I have a reason to talk about this. 
there are several students from one of the universities here in Telangana. Just because they have failed in one subject or two subjects, that is either four credits or eight credits, they are not getting their degrees. But 95% of them are working. They got jobs, they have some skill sets, they are all working. When it comes to the question of degree, no, they are helpless. They are not able to write, uh, take the exam. For me, I can't think of organic chemistry in my life. It's a, it's a nightmare for me. It doesn't mean that I am uh, I'm, I'm unfit. You allow me to do some other course in place of organic chemistry. I am not going to pursue my chemistry as my career. So then why should I break my head to clear organic chemistry paper? Can we give some flexibility? Most of the students at undergraduate level are exiting for an employment. This is the truth. Am I, am I right or not? This is happening throughout the world. This is happening throughout the world. In Australia, I have seen that many Australian citizens are not coming for post-graduation education. In Europe, you don't find the local people coming to research programs. Only 10% or 15%. The only people from third world countries are going there. They say that it is a waste of time. They are getting jobs at the end of uh, their graduation. Why can't we build such a nice, strong undergraduate education system where I can get a job? I, uh, I will tell you, 75 to 80 percent of the people will exit from. Only those focused students will come for post graduation, who are interested in teaching, who are interested in research as a career. They will come. So for those students. Can we build a flexible system? Because the whole NEP is talking about flexibility, flexibility. Why don't you create 10% of the courses can be done in lieu of some of these courses, the student can pursue some other skill courses. No, I have written this mail. I mean, I have written this to your secretary already. Think about this. If you have any responses, you can talk to me later. Transfer policy, this is also a, a nice definition that uh, it's given, mutual acceptance of credits between two entities. Now, the, my point is, when it comes to the question of action, I met several uh, vice chancellors and I told them, you go back to your academic council or academic senate and amend your ordinances first thing. They stuck, dumb. I don't see any reason for them to go to EC or AC to get uh, amend their ordinances for this. It is time for them to go to academic council and bring these amendments in place. You have to accept ODL, sir they have given a, a, a letter also that ODL, the credits earned through ODL programs also should be counted, considered open distance learning, Swayam, NPTEL. Now, any other universities and colleges, I came to know through UGC, they have identified close to 135 institutions, NAC, A plus above, and top NIRF 100 institutions will be asked to deliver, offer online courses. You will get that circular very soon. They are working on it. So, some of you are there already. So, you will be asked to offer courses online. So, you allow students to do these courses anywhere. Then the problem is, the moment we are saying acceptance, no, 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 they may not be maintaining standard. And the moment if it is a self-financing college, people are having very low opinion. And there are good self-financing colleges who are doing wonderful things. Uh, my friend from Subramanya has come from RVCE. I can say they are better than most of the universities in South India, I can say. Let us not go by our names, allow the choice to the students. They are known better. If my guess is correct, in another five years, NAD will start even assessing the teachers through, yeah. I, I, I wish that should come as early as possible. NAD should start even assessing the teachers. <coughs> teachers should be known as five-star teacher, four-star, three-star. How we order uh, our uh, foods on Swiggy and Zomato, uh, when we look at those ratings. Uh, similarly, the student will also look at the rating that the teacher. The teacher 
maybe from good institute. If his rating is three star, why should I choose that subject? So that, that day is also not far off. It will happen. So let us not wait till such time. Let us accept, accept at this stage and amend your ordinances. Then when it comes to common skill courses, Because they have already issued another letter. <laughs> See, there is, they have issued another letter stating that all three are not in, all four are not in one letter. That's the only thing. Yeah, you have to, uh, what do you call, uh, put all, the, all of them together and read that. There are three more universities they have already identified. They have not issued, ah, yeah. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. So, okay, we, we will get that letter very soon. I mean, not necessarily we worry about this, but they have clearly mentioned in that report. Common skill courses, because I, I come from HRDC, when I talk about introduction of uh, skill courses, uh, many teachers say, we don't have resources, we don't have manpower, we cannot offer. Fine, you don't offer, please. But you allow the student to go to online and do these courses. There are so many skill courses in Swayam. There are so many skill courses in NPTEL. And the ones, uh, the, 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 the courses that are offered by IIM uh, Bangalore, uh, there are some skill courses. And tomorrow UGC will give big, another big list. So more job oriented and need based if at all we can identify and there should not be any repetition. If University of Hyderabad is doing, IFLU and Manu can follow. If IFLU is, I know that they are very good in languages. If they do a program in language, we need not replicate this again. We can as well ask our students to get online and register with them. So this is the kind of uh, understanding that we should have. And this is where the problem comes. This is where the problem comes. Many self-financing people, when we talk about they, they are cursing me. I said, okay, fine. But you wait for the order that has come. UGC has already given, uh, not UGC, ministry has, government has given, uh, uh, rather issued uh, this ABC. It's a gazette notification, it's the rule. Now the student will come and ask that I am not going to take three courses this semester, so I will not pay the tuition fee. Yeah, that's it. Simple arithmetic. Please, don't think too much about this. So thereby, you fix the admission fee separately accordingly. Separate this tuition fee depending on the number of courses that you are offering per semester. Per semester, five average throughout the country, five or six, something like. So five into 4,000, 20,000 rupees, something like tuition fee. But if a student is taking only three courses, he'll pay three into four, 12,000 rupees. And also, I heard from Andhra Pradesh, another model, out of total number of 80 or 120 courses, the choice is given to the student to do up to 50%. That doesn't mean that the teachers will decide every semester. Teachers are deciding. You do two courses, you do three courses from uh, this semester, correct? The student out of 120, he can do 60 courses outside the, your college. No student will do, take it from me. They may do hardly 10 or 12, that's it, right? But the provision is up to 60 credits they can do outside the institute. And not necessarily a particular semester. Throughout three years program, they can do this. That's the kind of liberty that it is given. This is what exactly we have to put in place when it comes to the implementation of ABC. When you go back, please have discussion with your faculty members, with your head of the institute, that ABC implementation is the following, one, two, three. Start with amendments, second thing, fee, third thing, 
the choice of the course topics. Choice of the topic. You display. This is the menu. These are the courses that we are offering. Core courses, electives, ancillaries, skill courses. You do. Those who are which are not available, they will go to online and do. That kind of a flexibility we should provide. That is what I want to. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, please. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Sir Nirimati from Bhavan's Vivekananda College. Sir, what is the eligibility for an institute to register in ACB? ABC, sorry. ABC. You, are a, you have 2F? We have 2F, NF, 12B. Enough, enough. That's it. Sir, I read somewhere that uh, we should be NAC, uh, at least A grade uh, accredited and uh, NBA accreditation with no, a minimum if you, score. If you say that you have read somewhere, I also say the same answer. I never read that. Okay, the truth sir. is 2F, that's enough. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, for registering, you are not going to offer. It's only a registering at this stage. Basically, what kind of courses you are Ah, not even the. Basically, she is asking the question how to register. Uh, see, mm -hmm. then they, see, the moment they enter, their university also will come into the picture. Sir, uh, good afternoon, sir, uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Durga Kumar from JNTU Hyderabad. Um, like, um, so some student, as you said, um, done some first year uh, courses at some institute. He had completed all the courses. And now he wants to take up his uh, second year uh, admission in some other institute. Then uh, how do we uh, correlate the things, what he has done at first year level at some other institute, and once he came to our institute? See. If he is coming from within your university system, you have affiliated system. Once you said JNTU Hyderabad. So within affiliated colleges, the same admission procedure stands. If he is coming from other university, check whether they he or she has taken admission through a bona fide admission test or not. Because many of the state boards are conducting admission tests to professional colleges admission. Now, UGC is bringing CUET as a compulsory thing. So now, where is the difficulty? Second thing, courses that you said. He will bring that certificate. If you are registered in ABC, ABC will declare what are the courses he has completed, how many credits he has earned, he or she has earned. That's it. And for any reason, for any reason, if the student has not covered one or two, you can still give admission, ask that student to pursue those courses during summer time. He has enough time to complete those courses. Okay. Like, uh, suppose and he need not, that's what I'm saying, again he need not do those courses physically, please. He can do those courses online from Swayam and submit their certificates to you. Okay. Uh, uh, suppose some a subject title engineering mechanics. Oh, fine. Uh, uh, some institute has done like 50% syllabus is differing. Mm. Uh, with our institute, mm. then how do we account it? Sir, that is what I said, uniformity. Somewhere we have to bring in that uniformity. We cannot cite a rare possibility as an example and, uh, I mean, if you ask that question straight away, I cannot answer. <laughs> there is some common syllabus that every student should, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, follow. Yeah, yeah. Engineering drive. <laughs> Actually, transfer of students between two institutes is entirely the two institutes' business. Yes. It's not nothing to do with UGC in my understanding. So if your institute thinks that the student does not, coming from another institute, does not qualify for your curriculum, even though he says, I have done engineering mechanics, as you said, but you say, my engineering mechanics is this, and therefore you don't qualify, the student has to go to contention in order for transfer. My, from my understanding, it's only the two of them who are networked. The only thing is that bona fide transfer should, as Sir said, the bona fide transfer is that whatever he did in that college is bona fide and acceptable. The UGC cannot regulate 40,000 pairs, you know, 40,000 institutes, and if you take the number of pairs is 40,000 into 40, 40, 
39,999 divided by 2. <laughs> UGC should never get into that picture. Don't allow. See, another thing, the biggest mistake all of us as academics make, I'm on camera, okay, I know. The biggest mistake academics make is asking administration how to run the academic program. That should never happen. The academics should tell the administration this is the process that we have come up with based on the science and technology and the process. Please allow us to run and tell us a facilitation process to do. But if you run your academic business with administration, then basically administration does not know the technology, does not know the learning process. They will say, here is my rule. It's like going to the hospital when you don't have a disease. If you go and ask the hospital, do I have a disease? The hospital will find enough reasons to say, take all these things because you may have this, you may have this, you may have that. So academic business is entirely, as Sir said, is within the academic council of an institution and verification of the bona fide record of the individual. This is a general policy, but I'm sure there will be exceptions and he will know much more. True. That is what. Uh, any other question, please? Yeah. Quick, quick. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Raparna. I'm from Bhavan's College. Sir, I have a very small uh, naive question. So there is a 50% flexibility that is given uh, regarding the credits, which can be opted from the institution, and 50% can be from the outside of the institutions also. So this is a small thing. What will happen to the workload of the teachers? How to sustain the faculty in private colleges? And suppose if this is going to change, and we have uh, accredita in accreditation process, we have a teacher-student ratio. NARF will not award marks if, our, if uh, 15 uh, faculty, uh, they are asking for experienced faculty, middle faculty, and all the things. So NIRF, NAC, everything are interlinked with all these things. So how this, how much this is viable and how we are going to maintain See, that? this is what I said. Don't think too much about uh, these things at this stage. Students are empowered with a reason. If you ask truly, I'll tell you the secret. You should not feel bad. Many teachers are not doing their job as per the expectation. This is one of the strongest reasons the ministry said very vehemently. Right? That's the reason why people are talking about these alternates, not just because of the technology that it is available. As Sir said, it is a facilitation, not that, see, I am a student, I have to live on my own, I have to do some part-time job. Right? I'll, when I do my part-time job and coming to college, I'll miss my morning sessions. So I'll not be able to attend your classes. That doesn't mean that I'm unfit to, for education. So I will go for online education. And we are talking about increasing JER to 50%. As of now, only 30%. We are expecting another 20% to increase means you can think of the numbers. So there will be many students who will be opting for coming to the class. And there will be some students always, always there is an option. Right? As move, we move with the times, you have to move on. That's it. There's no other option. You cannot, uh, and also, when we talk about you bring in experiential learning, you guide the students, uh, the, the moment we talk about, no, 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 I am burdened with, uh, what do you call, extra work, non-academic work, uh, people coin the words immediately. Hey, this is where the academic workload also should be balanced. There will be some problem. It is paka. I am very clear. Dr. K. N. Subramanya, Principal, R. V. College of Engineering, Bangalore. I wonder how many of you know about this college. If you look at NIRF rankings or the status in the NAC accreditation, you will come to know. One of the very good engineering colleges in South India. And of course, if you take nationally also, they will stand. And he is heading as principal. Basically, he did his master's in uh, industrial management and PhD in supply chain management. I had the fortune to see his leadership while I attended some of the meetings in their institute. And he was one of the members associated with NEP implementation in Karnataka state, member of several academic and professional bodies. 
Apart from that, what I want to say in one liner, he was requesting me. They are the people who are actually implementing this. He knows in and out of the credits, how they can be. And one very important aspect of the whole discussion I have requested him to spare some time is on experiential learning. Many of you may not be knowing and if at all we talk about implementing NEP with that kind of flexibility that it is defined, there are two major things. The other one which I did not say in my talk, one is amending your ordinances. The second one is, please think about this, can we do away with this existing three-hour examination? A memorized test, we take 40 hours, 50 hours to teach the syllabus and expect the student to write the exam in three hours. Can we think of an alternate system? That's what I have requested Dr. Subramanian sir to speak. We will have discussion, right? So now I request on behalf of all of you, please welcome Professor <coughs> Subramanian onto the dais. Sir, please welcome, sir. Thank you for our accepting our invitation. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Very difficult after the lunch. Uh, I'll make it uh, a little bit lively. Uh, I have some 53 slides, but I'm not browse through all the slides. Wherever there is importance, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to tell only what we are doing. Because since morning, I have listened to all the things, whatever is happening in the country, and as per the document. I was actually very fortunate to associate with this NEP uh, kind of a exercise from 2017 onwards, because the convener of uh, NEP is uh, Dr. N.K. Sridhar, and uh, he is uh, my well-wisher for a long time. And he had asked me to conduct a lot of meetings in our state in engineering colleges to get some feedbacks. And uh, some things have been already incorporated in that. So, even though the title says credits and other things, since morning you listen to all these things, but I'd like to say the journey of, because uh, what I found is in all these things, even though you say it's a student-centric education system, but I feel the faculty preparation becomes very, very important in all these things. Because uh, I handle a course, I do it, I take some books and do it. Is it that sufficient? Or is there any holistic way a faculty has to see a course? Is very, very important. So, generally we all do a inward looking kind of an education system. Now we have to come from outside to the inside. What is the need of the society? What is the need of the industry? If you can take care of all those things, then framing the credit syllabus, everything becomes easy according to me. So the exercise I would like to inform you is that if you look into the whole uh, transformation, whatever has happened, the one thing you first look at is the industry and the society disruption, whatever is happening. If, if without considering if I start doing anything, no, it becomes very difficult, either for employability or for my student survival. Okay? So, lot of such things are already available. It could be the, in fact, uh, uh, NEP course, Sustainable Development Goals, in many places. So, uh, are we all uh, making this as a part of our overall curriculum or not is the one thing we have to look into. So, it could be a startup culture has come, instead of a job uh, seeker being a job provider is one more option. Maybe all 100% may not go for it, but we should create a path in the institution for somebody who wants to go to a startup. Of course, a uh, lot of changes are happening in the technology. They used to call it as a Moore's law. That means every 18 months the electronics technology is to change. Now they call it a more Moore's law. That means every 10 months technology is changing. Industry 4.0, we have started talking, but if we take countries like Germany, have industry 5.0 already, which is a collaborative robots. We are talking just about digital transformation and robots here. They already have a collaborative robots. That means robots working with human beings. Fine. Then uh, Japan is much further. They have society 5.0. That means they're using all the kinds of technologies which are available for the healthcare sector because Japan is a hedged society. So I think these are all the places because India is a youth population. Every youth a student of India is wanted by every other country today. So are we perceiving that when we are doing all our whole of education transformation is very important. So my sincere request to all of you sitting here and you can go back and tell your faculty, let them have an awareness of all those things. Grant challenges are available. Sustainable development goals are there. If you don't take all these things and try to frame a syllabus, 
then it becomes very difficult because at least in the next two one decade, I see there are a lot of such things have to be implemented across the world. Fine. So that is one thing which you have to take care when we are formulating the whole of the transformation you want to make. Other thing is I think education as you know that is also taking lot of changes. So uh, in fact uh, thanks to Corona actually uh, some things have been done maybe we may not have done perfectly everything but at least people would have started otherwise it would have taken more, 5 more years to go for that. But in a quick, even ten years. yeah maybe. So very quickly we could adapt to lot of the platforms how to prepare material, how to talk, all such things have already happened. But that has to be continued in a better way and some innovations have to be done on that. Then uh, education 5.0 is already there in some of the places. Are we trying to work with, I am going to tell you what are those things in little bit more detail. Then uh, obviously all of us are uh, accredited, accreditation either NAC, NBA or it could be NRF ranking or it could be the international rankings. We are all a part of that wherein all these things are asked by all these committees, how we are trying to get link. Then uh, obviously as a student if you talk, already they have defined uh, World Economic Forum has defined 21st century skills needed uh, for engineers in particular. Let me tell you my speech will be a little bit more on the engineering side because I am comfortable with that. But I am sure that uh, similarly it could be applied to the other fields, whatever is uh, the development happening in your field. Then uh, other one. In fact, we say student centric. You know, student is the same student as we have seen 20 years back? No. Dealing with a Gen Z, Gen X, in fact, all the English alphabets are all now, they say Gen Alpha also has come. Fine. So, how do you deal with these people? Their kind of retentions are all very, very less. 10, 12 minutes. They cannot sit in a class. So, is it my same way of teaching is okay? No, or I should change it. We always expect student doesn't sit in the class. I think Sarah has given a lot of examples in the morning that it is better we change and try to make changes in the students also. So that is where the pedagogical changes, andragogy, heterogogy, lot of things are have already come in the education field. All those changes also have to happen and obviously interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary nature is one more thing which is uh, presented in whole of the NEP document. Is it really interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary we are doing? Actually I am not sure still. We may not have even started. I will give a simple example. In my college there was a subject on mechatronics. If you say mechatronics, which department comes to your mind? Mechanical. That is predominantly by that department. Then I told, okay, there is a four hours uh, course, two hours electronics faculty let them teach, two hours mechanical faculty them, let them teach. What they did? Electronics portion he taught, mechanical portion he taught. <laughs> and questions were asked similarly to the electronics and mechanical. So I asked these people, I asked the mechanical faculty, have you seen any semiconductor company? He has not seen. You ask any uh, electronics faculty, has he seen Toyota or any such companies? He has not seen. But we teach mechatronics subject. So we don't even understand the reality is what is happening there. See, fundamentals will remain the same, let me tell you. Archimedes principle, Newton's class and all will not change. But the way it has been applied in various sectors is a, as an engineer, is a practitioner. So you should remember that as long as I don't try to create a difference in the society for the industries or for the society, we are not needed. We are not needed. So in that way, uh, real understanding of industry still has to st start happening. Okay? If you start today, I think another 5 to 10 years it may take, so that we will all be very comfortable working with uh, the things. Then uh, learning, this is another thing I don't know, many places we don't try to highlight on these learning styles of the students. This has been beautifully done in school education actually. But when it comes to college education, we don't look into, because I am teaching now, no, here, for all the people. I think this teaching has been there for a long time with us. But uh, I don't understand the way I am explaining. All the people are understanding the same way or not, I am not sure. So there are, I am going to show those things. There are learning styles. Maybe in every class it may not be possible. But when I am grouping students for internship, when I am grouping for a project, can I do that? It is still possible. Because some students are very quick in practice. Some students are very good in mathematical and converting into labs or the practice. We should identify such things. Then our the job becomes very easier. Otherwise, uh, it will be a blame game. We keep on doing it. Then other one is uh, total pedagogy. I think there is expectation of active learning methodologies. Then uh, experiential learning, I will like, try to focus a little bit more on that. Obviously, uh, there are two things actually. We have uh, COCs and COEs in our college. COCs specifically focus on the skill development. COEs start from the training of the faculty and goes up to the research. And these COCs can also be converted to COEs after some time. 
So that's the path we have set because why I'm setting, don't think if I say COE, it's only for research purpose. Actually, it is not. Because you have PhD students with you, you have MTech students with you, you have B students with me, and I can go on giving, integrating the things. Fine? That's how these things would be helpful. Maybe you can look at this chart is very, very important for me if you say I want to implement some new things. As long as the faculty, each of the faculty doesn't try to get through this, then again, it will be a world wide in a new bottle. As some syllabus, I'll make some changes, maybe put Bloom's taxonomy levels, and then put it and say, okay, I've implemented. It cannot be like that because as long as we go from, don't come from outside to the inside, NEP looks at that actually, the kind of changes which has to happen in the society. So this is a very important perspective we have started working since five years in the college. I don't say I'm still successful, uh, maybe 20 to 30 percent, but still it is okay for me because there's a lot of time for me to make changes. Then obviously, since morning people have talked, so what are the things we are doing as a part of the academics? is that uh, choice based because we became autonomous in 2007 and we had some flexibility in formulating the syllabus and other things. Choice based has been done quite some times back, but it was not really choice based. We had some restrictions in that also, but we have started doing into it and we already offer uh, the interdisciplinary electives uh, for all the students in the campus. For a long time we have been doing that. And ICT and active learning methodology, uh, ICT enablement was there before but it became a little bit more accurate after the post uh, pandemic. And now I think we are trying to go it in a uh, aggressive mode for this ICT learning. And active methodology, because uh, the teaching methodology is like this only, no? We keep on doing it. But active learning method, I'm going to show some methods. In 60 hours, uh, 60 minutes class, what are the ways you can do things? So that uh, we can keep uh, the students active always. Of course, uh, labs I'm going to tell you. This is another thing. I think NVHP also advocates liberal arts. Liberal arts, uh, there are two parts into this. A liberal art is a dance, a sports, whatever it is. That is anyway going on as a part of extracurricular. In fact, that also included as a part of a credit now actually. For some of the people who are putting a lot of effort in that direction. But my interest in liberal arts is how can you integrate liberal arts with the science and technology. If somebody wants, you can read a beautiful article written by Dr. Anand from IIT Chennai. Beautiful article. How we have to integrate? I can give a simple example. We are doing a product design. Okay, if I want to do a product, let us say you take this. If I want to do this design, is it only the technology part here? No, there is an artistic view to this. Shape, forms and the structures, what I am going to create for this is an art part. If I want to do this, let us say I am going to hold this, correct? For everybody is not pretty. This has been done by, I don't know where it has been done. But what happens, our anthropology is different, anthropometry in the country is different. So even without knowing the anthropology of my country, I am trying to develop a product. But many of the products are anyway coming from Japan or Germany. If you take Germany, huge machines you are having. It may not even match with my heights. Because in India, heights starts from uh, Kashmir and goes up to Kerala like this. I am not, so can I put a liberal arts part into it, teaching an anthropology to an anthropometry to product design? If we can do it, in fact, the best example would be always the Benz car you can take. The shape, form, the structure, the function, the aesthetics, whatever is given. I am looking at developing such kind of things in the college. Apart from looking into all the, the dance, music, students are good in that. Then how can I link? Let us say human mission interface is a huge subject in computer science. But uh, are they really knowing how to man machine system modeling? They may not know. They will be always looking at software development. Even the color putting on the screen is very important. All the colors, all people may not like. So how do you do that? So in human Im machine interface, even the ergonomics parts comes into picture. So I am trying to look at uh, how can I integrate liberal arts with science and technology is the one. Obviously, in fact, uh, uh, very precisely told that uh, uh, the skill development and everything up to three years because uh, you have uh, one year drop, two year drop, or three year drop, or fourth year also you can do it. We want to focus on research based learning in the final year as far as possible. Because this is one thing, uh, we have already decided that, okay, students don't go for MTAC, students don't go for PhD. But I think it's our effort to see that at least 5 to 10 percent have to focus in this area also. So maybe you have to create some interesting research courses in the final year as good electives. All may not take, anyway, electives are not taken by all students. There will be a number. If there are 30 students who are very good, no? In fact, this is a feedback given by one of my students in the college. She went to Carnegie Mellon for MS program and she was telling me, Beautifully, she gave me a one-page writing. Why this would be needed? 
So I also request you can go back and one of the most important stakeholders would be the students. Go back and try to find out what they want. I think we can design the systems in a better way. Okay. So these all the things in the bits and pieces or uh, let us say uh, I can say iteration one. We have started doing it. It can go up to iteration one in next 10 years. But uh, we have started uh, last year actually and uh, Karnataka is a little bit uh, uh, one of the first to implement NEP, the higher education actually. Last two years back only we started and uh, we are doing iteration two. Obviously all these are, the, I will not go into some of the slides here. But uh, as the server was also showing these kinds of uh, uh, areas, if I, anybody want to look like to this, these are all the areas in the next 10 to 20 years, lot of products in India itself we need actually, forget about the other countries. So are we gearing up, is having a robotic subject, is it, robotics may be there in mechanical, but an electronic student is also needed there. A robot is one device which is totally interdisciplinary in nature, you need ergonomics, you need instrumentation, you need software, you need hardware. All the things are needed. So are we teaching these kinds of a subject that are interdisciplinary? Because if you take any subject here, everything is interdisciplinary in nature. Fine. So this is another focus. We are the lot of changes which are happening, and these technologies are being left and right applied in all the sectors of economy. More so in uh, different cities, it uh, it may vary. If you take Bangalore, it is in BT, it is in IT, it is in aerospace hub. Manufacturing is not a total manufacturing hub, Bangalore. But we do some operations. But if you take, let us say, Tamil Nadu, Coimbatore, they try to use all this in the manufacturing technology. So this is where you have to use the flexibility. A robotics uh, importance might not have been pulled, not found in some city, but in other cities, it may be very important. If we can make the things contextual in nature, then uh, the job employment in that area could be very much feasible. So these are there anyway. It is all related to that only whatever I had told. I am sure that. Uh, 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 IIC, I mean IIT has done a beautiful course on data science. You know, I, I think the uh, number is very huge. People are registered. That is a, that is a important, I cannot say data science is a computer subject, data science is a mathematics subject, I cannot tell that. It needed for everybody. Fine, like that, in spite of what are the branches we have, you can still have a core courses for your branch and try to add all the things so that it will be helpful for the students. This is uh, what is education 4.0. I think uh, we should thank NPTEL for that. Actually, they have done many of these things have been taken care through that. Many of these things. This is typically education 4.0. In fact, more so, I understood this slide more so during COVID period actually. Before that, I understood a little bit, but uh, during COVID, I tried to know each and every one, whatever is given there, no, has got a lot of meanings in it. So that 40, up to 40 percent, whatever EGC has told, I think uh, we cannot stop that. For a period of 10 years, you may have to definitely go to that number. But we can start from 10 percent, 20 percent based on the availability, the faculty, availability of doing it, how your faculty can do it. Based on that, you can start doing it. This is a wonderful opportunity for all of us. And uh, if you can just go back, whether you are an arts college or a science college or a man, it does not matter. Everybody is needed here. It is only our perception of what to look into. Fine. You can look into these things uh, because even today people are looking for, I was asking somebody, I will give a beautiful example. I had gone to a German consulate once. There are uh, civil engineering as you know that uh, some of the drop is there in the country uh, for the students who are opting for civil engineering. So I had gone there even in Germany they said there is a, that kind of a slide is there. So then I went to one person, they had prepared a half an hour video. Half an hour video of why civil engineering is important. It was done by the best civil engineering professor of Germany. And you know who is the other person who was there with him in the team? He cannot even imagine a film director. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> film director. And I was talking to both of them. The way they explained civil engineering, you know, they take only Burj Khalifa as the example. And they dissected everything that Burj Khalifa and explained why civil engineering is important. You know, there you have technology, you name it, everything is there in that. So, like that. Uh, it is our uh, intelligence to find out what is there in all these things for us. Because if I say these things, hey, that is engineering, this is science, people say like that. Actually, it's not like that. Art, science, engineering, technology, management, information system, everything will come for everything, but it's only the way we view it. These are the skills, so I think this is again very, very important. 
This has been already highlighted in many places, even in NEP documentary is there. What are the 21st century skills which are needed for? Uh, generally, they say engineers, but actually it could be applicable to many fields also. Fine. So you can look into that uh, the foundational literacies, competencies. I am sure in some colleges uh, for placement activities, some things are done in this. But they expect this to be a part of your curriculum, part of their learning, overall learning in the three years or four years, whatever they do. So this is another thing which you have to keep it in mind. Of course, sir was telling in the morning, at least uh, uh, engineering institutions come under uh, NBA accreditation, program-wise accreditation. I think we started our accreditation in 2007. So uh, OBE has been little bit understood in a better way. I don't say still again 100%. Because everybody interprets in a different way when it comes to the attainment, Bloom's taxonomy, somebody gives a level 2 question, calls it as a level 4 question. So all such things are still there. But still, at least uh, the fundamentals of this have been understood by many of the faculty. So this is the way they are looking for, even in fact, in, even in NEP, no? I think this is the way they are looking for. But let me tell you, uh, you can see in your uh, cases, I don't think in the assessment we have come to that level or not. Outcome based assessment, we are not still there as uh, they were telling three hours examination is the determining factor for a student of whatever they are studying. Fine. So, this is the way they expect people to do it. This is, I think, Sarah has explained in the morning about the Bloom's taxonomy levels. In fact, is some, I, I told my faculty to keep this on their table. Okay, whenever they set a test paper, a quiz paper, a final examination paper, I think all these, in fact, uh, most important thing is I request all of you to read the original paper return. 1953 paper, 2001. You should read too, because generally what I've seen is people read only words there. Okay, let us say I'll give an example. Compare a tail stock, I mean a three jar check and a four jar check. And they put under what level? Analyzing level they put it. Actually, it's a foundation only. So that's why if you see words now, uh, then uh, there is the misleading of the things. Because uh, there the words are very, let us say, can a student distinguish between different parts? Can a student justify a stand or decision? So every level has got a different meaning here. But by and large, our systems are the first two levels only. As of now, we have seen the first two levels. But in our college, we have made little bit gone up to, let us say, 20%, uh, 40%, 20%, 10%. Like that, we have put even in the question papers also. The question should be of that kind of a thing because if student is very good, he should be in a position to at least solve level 3 problem very well in the exam also. But level 4, 5 and 6 is fundamentally in your projects, experiential learning. There are a lot of ways to evaluate those things. So this is very, very important. Uh, if you want to really look into from learning point of view to the assessment point of view, this is going to give a lot of uh, uh, information. So holistically, if you take what all things I explained until now, fine. One end is industry 4.0 and 5.0, other end is sustainable development goals, other one is 21st century skills, other is the Bloom's taxonomy levels, other is in education 5.0. Because at least in engineering colleges, we have program outcomes which have been beautifully defined by MBA. And these are the program outcomes I have done. So I, I had to do a reverse approach. Now if I want to really understand even going before framing a syllabus, I should know all those things. Then I come back and see what all things I need. But now it's not like that. We do everything here, try to fit to POs, to COs, we try to fit. That's where we are all failing actually. Fine? So this diagram is very, very important actually. I am sure uh, in our degree courses, I am not sure how the, the program outcomes are defined for a BCom student comes out of three years. What is expected out of him? Here this is expected of for an engineer. But I am still fair. Fairly enough that many things could be taken for uh, others also. It could be in a different way. Fine. So this diagram is, is the starting point for me to anybody who are looking at changing the syllabus, framing the syllabus. Without doing this, if you do it, anyway, there are good books available. You can straight away take it and teach it. But if you take this, let me tell you your focus, the way we teach, the way we understand would be entirely different. So this is one of the things actually, uh, sir, subject only chemistry. Uh, so one of my faculty, I have asked all my faculty to do in the college. Take all these things and put it in the POs and see what all the things you can teach in the class. Then your job becomes very easy. Framing the syllabus based on all those things and putting under a PO. 
If we can do this, then you have a channelizing of the things. Otherwise, we have to struggle at the end and make a postpartum report. Instead of that, if you come from the other side, this becomes very easy. This was I was telling. At least in projects, at least in experiential learning, try to group the students under this category. Many say that uh, these are all school level things, but I still feel even in the college level, many of these things are applicable. Okay? And uh, I had been to one, uh, a school in England. They are following in uh, Montessori, many of these things. So if you can categorize people into like, see, otherwise what happens now, you call a person, ask everybody to give seminars. And you say that fellow is not good in English, but he may have a good content. So like that, what happens is we have to make students very comfortable. Because now in engineering, they want to do even in different languages also. In the local language, they want to do it. So when that is the case, so nothing should be a barrier for a student actually. Fine? So this is another way you can try to look into it, how to categorize the students. If you have 60 students, can I put, need not be all the baskets, whatever you feel comfortable. In fact, there are psychometric tests for these things. At least the first grass level, to identify there are psychometric tests. You can try to identify his uh, characteristics and then try to do it. These are the active learning techniques which you can always use. Think, pair, share, polling. In fact, Mentis is a beautiful uh, software. You ask a question and you can immediately on the screen, you can get all the answers. And it gets recorded. You can, there's no need to separately one hour quiz, separate type table, there's no need to put. Because in a continuous learning, you, know, you can evaluate a student in a very class also. It is possible. Fine. So you can look into think, pair, share is a beautiful concept which uh, many of my faculty use in the college. They ask some standard question and ask them to think. Individually they have to think. Then they should talk to the neighbor and then share. Beautiful answers are coming. Otherwise, I ask some question, I give answers, many don't even listen because we are not involving them in the class. So this think, pair, share is a beautiful model we can try to apply to look into the things. Of course, uh, Sari is an expert in this. Uh, now what happens is uh, because uh, I was also trying to look at, if you take a particular subject also, what should be online in that? What should be offline in that? Apart from the course wise 40%, 60%, even in a course, I have got four periods, four hours I have. Can one hour be online in that? How much could be the online in that? Because I want to make the time effectively used. Totally offline doing, we all know. I think how it is working. For a long time we have been doing it. Can I make a combination of this thing? If I want to make combinations, I think uh, there, I have named only few here. There are a lot of other things also available. Yesterday we had a meeting with the, our university with all the industry experts. Okay? Uh, it was Infosys, then it was Coursera, then it was uh, mm -hmm. l and has got a beautiful materials developer for the civil engineers actually. I think IIT professors are there in the team. So, uh, we follow Tata Technologies actually. Tata Technologies has got more than 745 courses which they are done. These are online. Our mechanical students take those courses. Fine? So, like this what happens is, now it is, uh, the choice, the middle portion is very important actually according to me. I may do this, I may do that, but what should be the combination? I feel each faculty has to work on this. It's not okay, HOD tells some things and you do this or some academic consultants, it's not that because this has to be implemented by the individual faculty. So can we look into these things uh, of looking into it? And the biggest problem we have found is that any, in, I can talk about an engineer, he doesn't have a business domain knowledge. He doesn't have a business domain knowledge. At least somewhere can we include. He doesn't know even the sectors of economy. He wants to go to Intel. Ask about how Intel works. What are the departments? How many employees there are? What is the stock? What is the share? You ask management, they will not be knowing. So business domain knowledge is missing. In fact, uh, that's why even the startups who come up, the success rate is less because that business domain knowledge is very, very weak in that. They may be good in some technology, but they may not be good in the business domain. So this is a McKenzie's classification. I think I request you, you can just use the free app, which is that. I read every day McKenzie's uh, app. Lot of beautiful information comes in that about all the sectors. You give aerospace sector, you learn what are the things which are happening in the world, what companies are doing, every detail is available. If, you do, if somebody feels uh, you are not comfortable handling, I am not sure in that, you can give an online course on that also. 
because students will be very good in learning uh, and uh, trying to learn. Because this, if you don't do it, no, then the end product, the prototype, converting the product into the market, whatever starters we are talking about, no, that will not happen effectively. We have to start when they are young. If we can do that, it will be very good. I was telling, no, integrate, integrating liberal arts courses. Already many people have defined, uh, even Professor Anand has given a lot of courses in that paper on what are things which could be taught. In fact, if you ask an engineering student, Constitution of India, why you have to read, you will ask. It does not even get connected. IPR subject, who is going to teach IPR? Generally, lawyers or attorneys. But actually, it should be taught by a scientist or an engineer who has a patent and then a lawyer. That kind of an integration has to be done. And I think uh, we have all the kinds of people in the colleges. We can do that, but some one thing, we have not done it. Fine. So these are all the uh, foundation uh, module and uh, core liberals. And then these are all the major electives I can give actually. See, cognitive psychology in the whole of the IT sector today is very important. In the healthcare sector, it is very important. So how do you teach that? So if you want to teach cognitive psychology, generally it is offered by computer science to, uh, departments. They teach only algorithms again there. But they don't know the psychology part of it. So can I integrate? That is multidisciplinary. Can I take a psychology professor and a cognitive part from the angle part of the model development? Can I take and ask the student to be that? Okay? Let me, I don't always blame a student. Whatever we teach, he will have. But fundamental problem is if I don't try to, first of all, I myself not convinced about some things, then it becomes a problem. So these are some of the courses uh, we have already started uh, offering the things. So now, if you do all these things, uh, there is no need to define credit and other things. You will automatically understand. But there is a fundamental work which has to be done. All these things are already available in the documents. But only thing uh, I would like to say, I was very fortunate to work with, uh, when we become autonomy in our state, Professor Sonde, who was a professor in IASC, extraordinary academician and administrator. He has guided us in doing what to do. He was, he was not deviating any part. See, the most important in a credit allocation is very, very important. This is where I gave a four credit course and it took, how do I give the credits? See, the credit should be given based on the importance of the course to the program. That is a fundamental thing we should understand. Let us say, as a mechanical engineer, strength of materials, applied mechanics, theory of machine, you should have a higher credit. Now, what people do? I have to interpret these things, sir. I will make uh, applied mechanics two credits, sir. Civil engineer applied to 230 means what he can do. So this is the fundamental definition of a credit. Credit is based on the importance of the course to that program is very important. Let us say IOT has to be taught to a civil engineer. It can be still a minor. Because his core whatever is there should have a higher credit. So that is the concept of uh, giving a credit. Of course, uh, this is what, uh, as for, uh, let me also thank I AACT, at least in the engineering part of it, they have given a lot of clarity. What are the questions since morning you are asking, no? For many of those things, we already have answers with that, because AACT has been uh, doing uh, this, particularly for engineering courses in a thing, and they are giving a lot of guidelines. See, it is a guidelines, let me tell you. Let us not again stick to that one. They have given something, but still we have a flexibility in whatever way you would like to experience. So, like this, we have ability enhancement courses. Universal human values has to be taught as a compulsory course as per ACT. Then we have Indian knowledge system, yoga, all sorts of the things which come under the ability enhancement courses. Fine. So this is the split we have already for 2021. Of course, we are all doing for 2022 because we recently changed the things. Slight changes we have made in this. Somebody was talking about project work and internship. We have 21 credits we are supposed to do. Our eighth semester is full project for 12 to 13 credits. Fine. So like this, uh, if, if you ask, no, if you ask majority of the people uh, in the core branches, they're uh, always the problem with them is what? They say out of 160 credits, professional core and professional electives, if you take, it is only 80 credits. They say, sir, all our courses have gone. This is a complaint we receive across wherever people are doing. But today's need is that. It is also supposed to augment a lot of other things with that. Fine. So that's how, uh, in fact, if somebody was talking about the multiple entry, multiple exit uh, is in scheme, already ACT has beautifully defined. In engineering, they don't want to give exit after first year. They want to give exit after second year, call it as a diploma. 
And third year, they want to call as a BSc in a specific program of engineering. And fourth year, honors. That's the way they've already defined it. And uh, if he wants to leave, in the second year, he should have done 80 credits out of 160 credits. And out of that, 50% should be the core courses. They've already beautifully defined it, all those things. So now we are framing the syllabus as per that uh, in the second iteration. This is uh, some of uh, the credits, the theory, the tutorials, and the laboratories are classified. And uh, this is a standard pattern we have been following for quite some time to take care of it. So some of the courses may need tutorials, basically mathematically related kind of a course may need it. Then uh, you can have a lab, you can have an integrated course. We actually generally we have integrated course in Karnataka. Is that physics, no? Physics theory and lab should be studied together, not be studied. As a, I think this is Professor Sonde's uh, thing that he has insisted that it should be studied in an integrated way. Otherwise, what is to happen? Strength of material they study in third year, material testing lab they study in fourth year, I mean fourth semester. By the time that fellow comes here, you would have forgotten all strength of material's uh, fundamental things. So like that, wherever, even in your cases also, you have to, somebody is teaching English, no? English theory and practice could be together. It could be made, it is possible. Commerce, if you are teaching accountancy, you can make tally as a lab. And commerce subject, it could be an integrated course, three plus one or two plus two, whatever is, uh, more comfortable to the people. So this is the credit structure we are following actually, and uh, there could be slight variation in the way you are going to do it in your cases. So, but the thing is that one credit is two hours for theory. I mean, one credit is one hour for theory and two hours for laboratories. That's the standard norm we have been following for quite some time. So as I'm already telling, in ability enhancement courses, we have already started looking into these kinds of things. So the option, in the, in the, in fact, this is in the second year, we've already done it. We have put a basket of these courses, what has been given there, NCC, NSS. Many people are asking me, no, no, this you make it audit course. Don't put a credit course. But I have, we have done this in the beginning, when we were in the NBA, and we found audit courses are not taken seriously by students. They're not taking. So the characteristic both should be there for these students. If you don't give something, they're not doing it. So then we decided it's okay. Somewhere I may have to sacrifice one or two credits. We'll do that. But uh, we have made all these things. You know, let me tell you, we have a good music team, a dance team. In our college, we have film directors are there. And then dancers are there. Asian Games and Olympic players are there. And let me tell you, when we did the music and the dance, no? We have beautiful state level dancers. We, we call them. They helped us in making the syllabus. Students. Because my faculty may not know, no, dance and music may not be not your faculty. So we are also hiring the professionals to teach that particular things. So it is in a basket. Whichever students want out of that is a one credit course, they can take it. Then these are all the courses uh, we have identified. Not all has been taught. One of the very interesting courses you can look into, sorry. Look into is this digital humanities. It's a good course actually. ACT has already come out with a book on that, Digital Humanities. Because how you are going to deal with this uh, digital generation students, no? Will be entirely different the way we have to deal all of us. So it's a good subject, which needs a lot of the art part as well as the technology part. Both are there, needed there. This is the one more path we have created in the college. See, what happens is we want to uh, be, be, make some people at least the job providers, no? You want to make them job providers. In final year, suddenly you say you put an entrepreneurship development subject and uh, somebody comes with an idea. Okay, you do this prototype, it's very good. I cannot set that path. It needs a beautiful work. In fact, uh, I forgot the name of the university in USA. When the students come for first year, uh, when in the first year, first day session, when they conduct the inauguration session, what they ask is, uh, they ask how many wants to become entrepreneurs here? They found out that uh, so many people are raising the hand. And you know, they created a B program in entrepreneurship itself for such students. That's the kind of flexibility people are doing in the world. I think we have to open our ears and uh, then start looking into it, how we can uh, make change. So we have an idea lab in the first year. All these things are related to little bit on the work and the innovation part. Then in the second uh, year, we have two credit course on design thinking. Then we have a three credit course mini project, 16 credit course major project. And through that, we have set a path of incubation. 
we can we fund our students actually for incubation up to 10 lakhs we pay them and then uh, I uh, let me tell in the last four years we filed around 60 patents from the college out of the 35 patents are from students of undergraduate and two to three have gone up to the startup level also so this path if we don't create in the institution we cannot say they will be always looking for the jobs only fine if, in fact after following this path all may not go to do a startup but it's okay entrepreneurs are also needed even in companies innovation is needed wherever they join and after some time you may come in a startup company you may start doing it so both ways it's a win-win situation we should try to create this path this is what sir was telling uh, this i have identified as the experiential learning methods okay this uh, i don't say all the things we have followed my uh, holistic understanding of this experiential learning was in four years there are 49 numbers here totally 49 are there in four years if a student can make a jigsaw puzzle of all those things and see that based on the course i given a liberty to my faculty i have given this sheet to them and i have told in each of the course based on your course what is needed take two to three out of these for each of the course and give a choice to the student because we have uh, almost around 40 marks out of 100 marks is experiential learning so i told them give a choice to the student somebody wants to do a literature review somebody wants to go to industries and make a study and come back and submit a report and uh, let me tell you there is one second year student in my college he is very good in mathematics he is very good in vedic mathematics also he has already written some three to four chapters in that book by taking the help of Professor Mahadev from IIM and other people. There may be some skill in students like that. So that is the way we should try to encourage the student. So you can look into, I have classified it, but uh, there is no need of even classifying also according to me. You can give it as a bucket. So course augmented, innovative methods, industry institute symbiosis, liberal education, the co-curricular activities. So let uh, one more thing we want to do is let us say a person like this one full day, you organize three lectures for a student. No? you organize then you can give at the end of three lectures uh, quiz questions for these students it is possible actually so that otherwise what happens if any lecture you organize you have to pull student to come and sit now there is a problem students don't come for all lectures so try to create some kind of a motive and say this is a part of a grade i am going to give marks then everyone will come and sit there so you should make those things very lively for the students and how much of weightage of the marks you are going to give depends on the type of subject depends on the intensity which the student is doing all these things are there in it but we can try to look into experimenting this in a jigsaw puzzle if a student can do it four years uh, then i feel personally i feel that i am confident that he can be definitely a better engineer of course we have virtual labs we are a part of coursera we are a part of nptel and uh, uh, this is what i was telling an idea lab in the first year we have introduced for all the students 1300 students go through this then uh, design thinking methodology is one which has become very popular we introduced five years back in our college a design thinking approach you know what i have done here because i had to look into sustainable development goals now so what i have done is i put all stgs for design thinking lab since four years i am doing that what i have done is i take mechanical uh, aerospace electrical i have given them energy i have taken civil chemical and uh, biotechnology I gave them water. All these are the, and uh, let me tell you the kind of things the result it is giving. It is a two credit course. Uh, student is putting full semester effort for that. Because it is his passion. It is his passion. Fine. But for a four credit course, he is studying only two days before the exam. For a theory course. So somewhere, if you blend these two things, no, obviously the, that the blame game from both the sides will not be there according to me. So, we have been doing that. In fact, uh, for this, you know, what is my assessment? Assessment, finally, I conduct an exhibition, that is the examination. I am not conducting a two hours, three hours exam, uh, lab sit there, ask where, no. I am putting two full days there, standing there. I am calling industry experts also. In fact, uh, this time when we did it, no, in energy and water, two, two projects have been selected in Mercedes-Benz to take it to the next level. So, uh, we have to be innovative, but let me tell you, uh, oh, what happens if I give marks? How do you give? The fundamental problem of a teacher is you get stuck to marks and exam. I think that is where we are all facing a lot of problems. Don't worry about examination in the beginning according to me. Something will happen. Some error will also happen. Don't worry about it. Start working out on that. Our interest is what? As Sir was telling, 
90% of the people who fail, they are even up to the Nobel Prize. So then what is so great about the thinking that, okay, this fellow is failing, this fellow is not, not, not have to worry about that. Please start doing it. Individually, if uh, five, six faculty in a college start doing it, no, that becomes a, like contagious and people start doing it. But the problem is who should build the cat? That's where we all stuck up. I think uh, being people here who are all leaders in your own things, please take that step and start doing it. That's what I do in my college. I, I have fear also sometimes, but uh, still I am not, I have stopped asking the results of the students from my faculty since three years. I don't ask the results because there are a lot of experimentations which are happening, no? I know that. Some things may not be there. Otherwise, what happens? You should get 90% your appraisal, you will get 10 marks. Otherwise, if I do it, I cannot do these innovations. But that does not mean I will leave them. Okay, but I have other ways of measuring it. Other ways of measuring it. Okay? So we follow five-step methodology of uh, empathize, uh, define, ideate, prototype, and test. It's a five-step methodology. This has been followed by Stanford University for a long time. Maybe for 60s, 70s, they have started this methodology. Of course, there are a lot of other methodologies. Three-step is there, six-step is there, four steps are there. But the ultimate meaning is same. So somebody was asking about the skill development. Apart from the regular lab, whatever we have in the college, in the second, first year and second year, I have done a skill lab separately. This is not a part of a syllabus. We ask the student to select any one or two here. Each one will be conducted for 10 days, 5 hours, 50, 50 hours. 100 hours I kept in first year, 100 hours I kept in second year. Okay? So, uh, Madam has had some doubt. The party credit is it a part of this, is not a part of this. I am not taking this as a part of the party credits. I have taken it as extra. Because there is a learning which happens to the student. Let it happen in a better way. Fine? So, then uh, this is first year and this is second year. Second year for all the branches, specific to the branch is also there. If somebody wants to do interdisciplinary, he can also do. So out of this, he can select any two and do it. Any two skill labs and all these labs, whatever I have, is with the industry labs. So we have a lot of more than 100 companies, MOUs are there in the college. And all top companies, they have a very good skill lab developed and I am going to attach those things to this. This is not a part of a syllabus anyway. Fine? So this I am allowing all the students to do it because I don't know who is going to leave after first year, who is going to leave after second year. I don't have any control over that. So we are making to all the students to learn this skill labs. These are the, some of the labs I, I was telling you. They are Mercedes Benz, Toyota Kiloskar, Tata Technologies, Morris Garage, MNRE has given some of Surya Mitra and Varuna Mitra kinds of projects. We are helping students even to learn that. Of course, skill development through ACT we had some certain thing. And we have a Boston training center they are given 60 lakhs worth of a IP intelligent processing unit wherein it could be used for data science kind of a AI and machine learning kinds of things. So these are the labs I use for the development of the skill of a student. Of course English is there. Uh, English is not a traditional English we are not teaching. We are teaching a business English. And this is considered as a lab. I don't have any faculty here. First I have told my faculty to learn this. Okay. All these things. These are all uh, we were having Pearson. Then we had Megra Hill. This year we have Hindu group actually. Hindu, they got a beautiful material actually. It is a one-one credit in the first and the second semester. They go through the online whenever they want. They go through it. There will be tests on the examination. And we have found uh, my final year students have tell me, told me that this has even helped them for IELTS and TOEFL also. It has helped for them in that way. So that's the path uh, which you are trying to create. I will not go into this. This is another important. I, I request all of you. Please try to encourage students to go for these innovative teams. We have 16 innovative teams on campus. Each of the team has got 200 students. From first year to final year, no, they keep on doing the things. They are, for the example, if you take Ashwa Racing Car, that's the oldest, 20 years back it has been started. Their ranking in the SA in the world is 5 now. There are 250 students working there. You know the kind of jobs these people get. Beautifully they are getting. And they know all the things, uh, tricks of the trade, import, export, substitution, because they go to outside, you know, for competition. They know import, export, substitution. Logistic service provider, my student comes and tells, uh, why are not taking from BRL, which is by the side of my college, no, sir, in Pune, it is cheaper, he says. National level survey, they make on all those things. Fine. I request either science, commerce, arts, it doesn't matter. Please make this team. These are the people who will be the brand ambassadors to your institution. At the same time, they will add value and others will also try to join these things. So these are some of the things uh, in, in, in fact in Bangalore if you ask today why you are joining Garvey College of Engineering. 
They don't say placement. So they are telling because of the innovative teams. Because there's a lot of beautiful learning which is happening here. And the, what is our one is, this is a parallel thing which was happening. They have to study here, they have to do that. Now I also started looking into integrating these, whatever work they do here, into the credit also. You have a final year project, no? A student group designs a car, they go for competition, they win the first place. What else you want? Can't we give some credit to them? It has everything in it. The business domain is there, the technology domain is there, the artistic features are there, teamwork is there. What are 21st century skills you talk about, no? Many of those things are already available in those teams. So I request all of you to please look into these kinds of team developments. Start from 5 to 10 because this has got, because peer learning is excellent always. They learn very well through peer learning. Of course, we have entrepreneurship development cell. And uh, this is one important thing. I think in your place, wherever it is there, we have a Samsung Prism project. Samsung gives a worklet to the students for a whole semester. There is a uh, mentor from our side. There is a mentor from uh, the company side. Every week they meet. You know, only one slide they should tell what they have done in that week. It is very difficult to write a precise writing. Essay yes, writing may be easier. So to tell precisely what you have done is very difficult. So they do that. And you know the kind of initially they gave only uh, some money in the beginning. And now 22 now, we have already got uh, more than 30 lakhs. It's a price amount they give to the student. They have a diamond, gold and things of that sort. And it's also shared among the faculty. And the huge learning, out of these projects, what we have done in four years, generally we are working in the area of 5G and uh, advanced technology in 5G. And you know, two of the patents have gone for international patent, which are jointly with Samsung company. Students are involved, faculty are involved, and also the company is involved in this. I think this, I leave the slide, you can understand what stage we are there, you can, I don't want to explain here. Sir. So, yeah. Sorry to disturb you, sir. Could you please, back to the previous slides. Sorry. Innovative uh, teams. Uh, oh, yeah. After this, before this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's not innovative teams, not very easy to. I spend one crore every year for these teams. <laughs> There's a finance attached to this. But uh, students get another nine crores from sponsors. <laughs> it's not a, all the teams put together, it's not only one crore. If you take a solar team, they spend around 1.25 crores every year for competition and uh, making new products. Could you please take us to the uh, slide just before the innovative team? Yeah, yes, I, sir. I did not go for this actually. Yeah. There's an organization called IUCE. I think some of you are maybe remember, I'm not sure. It has started by Krishna Vedula uh, from ESA. Yeah, you know him well. So we are a part of this. What we did is he's also trying to work somewhere in the NEP now. In fact, he's in Hyderabad only. He's in Hyderabad. And uh, in fact, tomorrow we have, we have created a spark team in the college of 60 students last year to experience, that means do an experience and learning. By all these things have been taught to my students, they have conducted the training programs for the students. Then we are telling, uh, same physics is taught for this batch, but it's taught in a different way because we are experimenting with it. Last time for these 60 students compared with other sections, no, I got 5% extra result for this batch of 60 students in all the subjects. So now this year there's a competition and uh, there are three sections we are making. Students only voluntarily coming. I want to be a part of it. So if this year if it works well, no, I think I want to introduce this kind of a innovative methodology of pedagogy and things because uh, Krishna Vedra, the team is very good actually. They have a lot of uh, professors from abroad, all the people come and try to teach that. So that's how uh, this uh, slide, I didn't want to take uh, time on that. Uh, if somebody is interested, I can get connected with who are in Hyderabad. No? I can ask them to meet, I think uh, they'll be very happy to associate. So this I was I was here. You can decide where we are. And uh, that is uh, if, uh, the last slide you take, no? Uh, actually that is transdisciplinary in nature. Uh, so any societal problem will be of the last thing. A, a traffic problem in Bangalore. Whom you have to associate? Is it an engineer? Is it a uh, IAS officer? Is it a politician? Everybody is there. So that's how there is no boundary there. Huh? 
it's a, so a societal problem, there will be no barriers like engineering, commerce, management, it will not be there. I think from here, we have to move to that level. I think that is the intention of any of the good policies what has been made. But we are all stuck up at different levels. Maybe if we can try to that, solve a huge problem of the society, that is what is needed by our engineers or whoever it is. And of course, uh, uh, I will not spend much time on the centers of excellence. I can just give a list of centers of excellence we have in the campus. Many of these things are industry sponsored. For example, Cisco has given us three crores. And uh, Macroelectronics was the World Bank Tech Two for phase two project. We have got 11 crores for that. And then we have a last one wiring project, autonomous vehicles we are working actually with IAC, Vipro, and our college. We are working with, they have given us 6 crore rupees. We are working on driver simulation and also natural data set of traffic in Bangalore. We are working on that. There are 125 students. So in my college, my problem is getting projects for the students is not at all a problem for me. It's very easy, internships, projects, very easy for me to do because I have created all this center. See, if you don't develop an ecosystem, forget about implementing any of these things. It's not possible. Even though the ecosystem is not there, how can you, how can you, a student would have not even seen a LEDA. How can you see LEDA, sensors, cameras, everything has been put and mounted on a thing. You know, kind of innovative what these people are doing is extraordinary. Fine? So if you create the situation, whatever the interdisciplinary nature you talk about, no, that will automatically happen. These are the centers I think I've already told you. We are offering electrical uh, vehicle technology also. So I told you this is the patent. This is another thing actually. See, typically what happens is uh, uh, the patenting, uh, generally, uh, we do certain things, no? We don't know whether it should be patented or not, but people don't do it. They simply go for competitions. Then once it goes as an outside thing, no, you can apply for a patent. In fact, they say, no, uh, you just go and explain to your Chinese. This is my idea. Next week, they do the product itself. So fast they are. But we talk more now. If somebody, oh, it's a very good explain means we'll explain everything. Next day, that fellow may do that in a different way and get a patent. So this is very important. If you find some idea is there, please, from the beginning, encourage the student to go for patents. It could be company plus college plus student. I could be only student. We spend actually 85,000 rupees per patent in the college. And we sponsor that. The patent will be in the name of the college. They will be the inventors. That model we are following. In the last three years, uh, or least, uh, yesterday night, one uh, patent was also granted, actually. So 70 patent. It is actually, let me tell you, it is less only, uh, according to me. It is very less. But somewhere, we have to push, because any file, I, I feel uh, we have almost around uh, MTech and BTEC put together, I get 800 projects in one year final year projects. Out of that, at least if I can take 100, take to the next level, that will be the number I should have. I think we are trying to force that this year uh, to do that. But somewhere what happens, uh, uh, many times the faculty only signs the report. You may not even know what the student is doing. All such things are very common. So because of that, what happens, even though there is a good idea, it will be in the library shelf, that's all. It may not be seen by anybody at all. So maybe somebody should take an initiative and try to force this, otherwise uh, we'll be losing on the patent part of it. Of course, uh, connecting the dots is one. So this is, uh, in fact, uh, this is the final uh, thing I would like to say that the developing critical thinking and incorporating liberal arts. They're all in bits and pieces. Connecting the dots is very, very important. You need, in fact, I was uh, uh, telling in other meeting, when we had a discussion on this ABC and other things, I was a part of a brainstorming session. We have an ABC document, you have a skill document, you have a credit policy document, and you have an NEP document. I was telling, please make a meta, meta committee. And all these things have to be put as under. Because if I, everybody tries to read it in a different way, and the meaning should be different. So if there should be a meta committee. I was telling MK Sridhar the other day, that uh, sir, please have a meta committee to make all these things so that uh, there is a common uh, formula so, so that people can understand. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult if you see in silo. Skill is separate. This one is separate. Maybe if I look like that, it becomes very difficult. So uh, connecting the dots, even in that, if we can do it correctly, then things are going to happen. Uh, this is very important. Actually, uh, we have to make our education contextual. This is missing, actually. In fact, somebody was telling, you know, chat GPT. Chat GPT will give answers for everything. Already, people are accepting it. But actually, it's not. Chat GPT is a good tool, even for learning. One. Point two. If I ask a chat GPT, Okay, we have uh, three junctions in Bangalore where traffic is always a problem. 
Okay, central silk board junction, traffic problem, how to solve, give it to chat GPT whether it will do or not. It cannot do it. I think our questions, the way we had to inquire, spirit of inquiry among the students should be made more contextual. It may still take a New York uh, kind of a traffic problem and then give some solutions. But it may not be actually whatever we need. So we should also make the education contextual, India-centric if you may, because we have so many problems just to be solved. If we can make like that, then we don't have to worry about any of the chat GPTs and other things which come. So assessment, I think I have explained. We have formative and summative assessments. We have two or two, three hours examination, lab examination. We also do exhibitions as a part of the examinations. Then projects are done in five phases. Then uh, with rubrics, I, I have it. I will not read everything. I will show you. Phase one, phase two, what are the rubrics? We have already set for it. Then uh, offline, online internships. In our centers, we provide. During COVID, actually 2,000 students did this online internship. Out of the 1,200 from other college, they are registered for these courses. Then uh, English online subjective and then activity points evaluation. Liberal arts courses, you can have a group work and evaluation. You need not have to do individual examination. These are the, some of the things we are trying to follow. This is what I was telling about the rubrics part of it. I will not go into details. I will leave the slides anyway. So this is phase one. What are the things to be considered? How do you give excellent, good, average, acceptable, unacceptable? Phase-wise project evaluations could be done. This has been beautifully defined even by NBA itself. And we have straight away taken that. And we are following this for quite some time. So I will not go into details of this. Phase two. Phase three. Phase four. Phase five. So there is, because it is a 16 credit course in our college, full one semester, if I don't evaluate it correctly, then uh, it will be difficult for me to get grades for the students. The best student only should get his grade then. So that's it. What is this whole exercise we are looking for? Whether you do OBE, you do all these things, what is expected? Final outcomes are employment potential to improve, then better accreditation and ranking at national international levels. Then we are looking at holistic education rather than education in silos for better living also, and not just for getting a job. Even balancing of the life also things becomes important through holistic education. Enhancing publications, patent, building incubation centers and startups. Then the deliverables, then contributing to the sustainable growth of the nation, then inculcating national spirit and made in India culture, and finally to make India an international knowledge of it is super power. I think that's a long-term objective of maybe 2040, 2045, whatever it is. Okay? So this uh, holistic picture we should have as faculty members. Then from the syllabus, from the courses, many things are already available. So we had to pattern, make into your uh, sage contextual and then it becomes very easy. I think uh, this is st just a step one. Yeah. So the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go. This is from Robert Frost. Okay? And uh, this is what we are in, everybody is in some level or the other, it doesn't matter. Everybody is learning only. Because we have seen during COVID, India did better than America. We thought America is a great developed country. And they are better than us. And we found that we are better than them. So in that way, we did not have to worry wherever we are there. But start from there. We need to start first. Because I see many people simply going on asking 100 questions, is sitting in zeroth position only. Even before starting, we have 100 questions. Whatever you understood, start implementing it, and slowly you will get answers for all the things. If you can do that, then it will be very good. So my final slide is thank you very much. And the sky is not the limit, and it is in the mind. Actually, if you can do that, I feel that we can do a good job. I thank uh, Narsimulu for giving me this opportunity to share some of my little experience, whatever in the uh, field. And hope uh, if anybody would like to collaborate on doing such things, we will be very, very happy to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You uh, made all the people to be alert. I did not see anybody sleeping. Uh, the talk was nice and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, see, we are going to put all the PPTs and recordings on a link by tomorrow or at the max by Monday. And the live recording is going on. I did not disclose. It is live streaming. Some people are watching outside also. It will be on YouTube in another three, four days. Right? Please, don't worry. Don't, you need not take pictures of all the slides. We will share all these things 
as a, a, a matter of pride and uh, the practice, in fact. It's a practice of our uh, HRDC. Any questions or any comment from uh, the participants? Yes. If there are no questions, means there are two ways of understanding. <laughs> you understood everything or I confused you a lot. I don't know what I've done. The first one is true. Pardon? Yes. <laughs> now, the last sentence, what he said repeatedly, before starting, don't ask questions. Let us make a beginning. I think all of us are, ha are on the same path. Let us make a beginning. We will definitely, one day, that is what uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said. You will be sincere in your effort, you will reach your goal. If not today, tomorrow. Maybe in my case, after one month. That's it. Not <laughs> Yes. Oh, okay. Our issue of management. management. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. It's very fortunate for me to have uh, the webinars with you. And today, I'm very, very happy to see your presentation uh, and learn uh, so many things which we don't know, actually. Uh, so uh, we have to learn so many things. And as you told, like, uh, artificial intelligence and everything comes in our purview also. I'm in commerce. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, and another thing, sir, uh, I would like to ask you is, uh, uh, regarding this uh, interdisciplinary and uh, transdisciplinary, I am a theater uh, at Pashuar. Oh, okay. So I just started, I have not uh, disclosed it to everyone. I started uh, some way of teaching the commerce uh, topics in a uh, dramatic way, mm. in a dialect delivery way. So in that way, uh, if I am a useful at any point of time, okay. Sure. I am uh, very thankful for that right. because uh, that is a passionate thing for me, sir. Thank Good. You. Thank, Thank you very you. much, madam. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Thank you. And uh, now we will. Uh, yeah, yeah. Please. After this, we will have a tea break, right? Uh, we will have tea and quickly come back after 10 minutes. And the final session will be technology enabled learning uh, by Professor Srinivas. With that, we will uh, conclude the seminar. Yeah, please, madam. Go ahead. Sir, this is just a remark, sir. Uh, during your talk, so interesting. I just felt like that, you know, we are on some other planet and you are talking about something else. <laughs> yes, no, no. Know, literally, yeah, I yes, felt like that. Yes. And uh, especially because probably our college is, a, you know, not an engineering technology college. Uh, but uh, I just want to ask, yes, sir, like the kind of funding you are saying, this is one crore, this is, you are not talking in lakhs only. This team is like this. So I just want to know, sir, how many years of See, let me tell you, my benchmark is IIT Chennai. You ask them what is the funding. Last year, as per NRF ranking, they got 56, 560 crores of projects and 229 crores of consultancy. And nowhere near them. Okay, so uh, I was also thinking, even to write a 1 crore project, we were not knowing, let me tell you. To write a 1 crore project, 1 crore, how to, what to write? Now at least I can write for 10 crores easily. It's an experience. You should uh, dive into the sea. The many problem thing is what? We'll be here only and uh, not doing it. You start doing it, madam. We have taken a long, ours is a 60 years old institution. We are 89th in the NRF ranking. And a lot of people have worked in the college. Not, uh, I'm just representing that all here. Okay, lot of good teamwork is there. You start doing it. Let us not worry about uh, the results. It will come. If it is the right path is there, it will come. Thank you, thank, thank you very you, much, sir. Thank sir. you all. Thank Thanks you. for wonderful presentation, and uh, I thank you sincerely. The technology-enabled learning, how you integrate the credits, including online evaluation, and in the process, the speaker will also talk something about blended learning. This we were talking for almost one and a half decades in our HRDC, without uh, our when we were not even talking about NEP or credit transfer policies. And Professor Srinivas, uh, a professor of ICT from National Institute of Education Planning Administration, popularly known as the NEPA, uh, he is uh, basically a postgraduate in physics, then went on pursuing masters in computer science, then he did his PhD from Jamia Millia Islamia. More than that, that's what I'm saying, master's in MCA. But more than that, 
a, a practitioner, whatever he teaches, he practices and couple of uh, times he will uh, uh, validate them and then he will make present. I can say very proudly that he is the most sought after resource person throughout the country on this particular topic. So I welcome Professor Srinivas for this uh, session to uh, interact with our participants. Professor Srinivas, thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, joining us. Thank you, sir. Good evening, friends. Uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor and uh, Honorable uh, Director HRDC, Professor Narsimul Garu, and the respected uh, faculty members attending this uh, seminar. Andarki Nauskaram. Uh, one of the difficult sessions, uh, people often used to say the difficult session is the after lunch session. But I feel personally, it is not the difficult session. The last session is very difficult because already uh, tone was set, mindset was there. So, where is the experiential learning? Because everybody is expecting, and especially in education, you all must be knowing, we are only expecting miracles. Miracles never happens. Miracles never happens. It's all the hard work, hard work, hard work. You must have seen how uh, Dr. Subramanya is uh, telling and what uh, Dr. Gopakumar, one of this very important person, even though we call it as uh, administrative wing of government of India, but they are driving this country, University Grants Commission. Okay? So everybody is equally important here. And same thing with Dr. Mangal Sundar, one of my good friend. So the point what I'm trying to drive here is, so what type of efforts need to be made to make uh, this one possible? We have an NEP document available for us. NEP said many things. There are three important aspects. Let me focus about the NEP, because even though there are a lot of things on my slide, but generally my, I am a, a five-day player. But uh, Professor Narsimdu was giving me one hour to cover up many things. I don't know whether I do justice or not. I may please be excused also. Because I believe in my class, whether it is teaching, whether it is training, I put my class into four components. Lecture, discussion, demonstration, and hands-on. Activity within the class. Hands on means activity within the class. And I start my class with uh, not lecturing, discussion. So you may be thinking that how it was happened. This is not happening because of NEP, because of uh, we the people, there are five people, uh, we developed the blended learning document and shared with the UGC for their consideration, spending six to eight months time. We don't know what was the a fate of that document. But what I'm trying to say that we started implementing, again I must say very proudly, all these experimentations were done at UGC HRDC, University of Hyderabad. Then subsequently, these experiments were taken across India. Now people started realizing, earlier it was a training means training. One month certificate, one month certificate. What used to happen? So what I'm trying to say that when you start the class with a different tone, so it's not the hardware, it's not the software, it's primarily humanware. First of all, we need to talk about the teacher. We talk about so many things. And other than the teaching, we do too many things. Third Ford, I, I'm a member of Third Ford Committee. I'm a member of Purchase Committee. I'm a member of this committee, that committee, all the committees, wherever people are not interested, they put me a member of the committee. They're assuming that a professor of computer science will do miracles. Friends, it never happens. Please try to understand that. Even though we, we talk a lot about technology in this country. I don't know how many of you traveled. I traveled length and breadth of this country, starting from the Kashmir Ghati to the down south, Tutikudi, Paramagudi, Ramanathapuram, Mandapam and in this side, the Jabalpur to Barak Valley. So the situations are different. Mindsets are different. Difficult to convince the principals. Difficult to convince the micro, uh, the vice chancellors. And difficult, the people ask them to sit in a room to discuss. But everybody is saying that system is bad. This is bad. 
Why only RV College is progressing? Everyone is progressing correctly. Can I tell you something? It's not my words. The great saint of this great nation, Adi Sankara said, long, long back, he said, let me say in Hindi, then I'll come back to Hindi. Sishti mein koi dosh nahi hai. Sishti mein koi dosh nahi hai. Apne drishti mein dosh hai. Pehle drishti ko badalo, drishti achcha hai dikhai degi. There is no difference in the mother nature. Every college is different. Every school is different. Every teacher is a diamond. Every student is a diamond. We only segregate it. <clears throat> and because we only taking up uh, the policies, somebody saying something, and many times we follow saying that, ah, shayad hum bhi kar, se, kar sake aisa. And second point, being a professor of computer science, working in a social science humanities university, I deal with seven disciplines. Engineering, sciences, social sciences, humanities, law, medical. My learners are from these disciplines. So everybody is performing well. But only problem is the situations. Because many things we were controlled. Even though we are autonomous in nature, we never, exp we never uh, experience our autonomy kind of a thing. So this is with this background. Let me talk about Thanks to the technology, it is not moving. Hopefully, it will move. Yeah. <coughs> no problem, it has happened many times with me. I conducted a MOOCs workshop without uh, power and PowerPoint for two days. I have a habit of doing that. Don't worry about that. Hopefully, this will work. Emma? Full screen or only? It was in a full screen. It was in a full screen, Amma. It was in a full screen only. Huh. It was in a full screen. It was in a full screen. OK. Uh, the further details of my talk, and uh, uh, there are many other uh, resources, uh, the regulations are available on the site, which is free of cost. And you need not, you can download it, you can reuse it, reuse it, revise it, remix it, redistribute, without any difficulty as such. And this is the platform which I've been talking about using this blended mode, where now we are calling it as blended, in a hybrid mode I, I've been teaching last 15 years. Okay? So it's there all these details. So let me start with one of the best quote from Albert Einstein. And I have been using this quote very extensively in my, my lectures and talks. What he said, I do not teach anyone. I do not teach anyone. I only provide the environment in which they can learn. What is important is, how do we set up the environment for the learning? That matters. So only we talk about, we idealize institution A, institution B, institution C. But every institution is equally good. And at the same time, we were so much, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know what is the rat race going on, NIRF ranking, this ranking, that ranking, fine, rankings are good. But in the, in the process of getting that ranking, are we doing something injustice to our students? Because our students are not, everyone's learning style is different. I have slow learners. I have average learners in my class. I have gifted learners, of course. Other two things people have not mentioned. Other four things. I have introverts in my class. How to take care of them? I have extroverts in my class. How to take care of them? Another biggest problem, I don't know whether you face it or not, in, my, in the part of India where I work, language. Luckily, since morning, I have been hearing that we are speaking only in one language. But here, one language is not possible. I speak bilingual and most of the time multilingual. Thanks, I speak six languages. My mother is a Tamilian and my father is a Telugu and so many mix-up are happening and we are living in Northern India for 40 years. Many things are there. The point is communication is very, very important. And the last one, digital divide. How many of us are having, how many students are having it? How many labs are equipped? There are so many factors are there, friends. Number one. Number two, very important point. I think you all must have realized. Before Corona and after Corona, 
there's a lot of change happen in our teaching learning process. Okay? Before Corona, we have uh, a conventional classroom based teaching. I call it as on site learning. We have MOOCs courses. Of course, my good friend uh, uh, Professor Sundar was very much here. And of course, we have, there are some institutions we already started the short term online courses. These are the three options are available. During the Corona period, online classes, well, one process of online classes was happened. Then, during the Corona period only, the government of India brought the NEP. There, there is a mention about the new educational policy. I'll throw some light on that. Because of one of our time, I could not able to spend much of the time. And of course, open and digital learning courses in online mode. So then, of course, we have ABC, Academic Bank of Credits, Credit Transfer, so many things have been happening. But all these things driven by the teacher. The teaching learning process confined to the four walls of the classroom now shifted to the living rooms of the students. So not only your students, their parents, everybody is watching. Watching means, like in Hindi we often used to say, teacher was bechara, teacher was lachara. Because everybody is commenting, sir, thoda pot Hindi mein bolo. Recently in one of the workshops, sir, I said, good morning, thank you to uh, HRDC director for providing me the opportunity. Achanak somebody raised the hand. Sir, bohut jada angreji ho gaye. Thoda bohut hindi mein bolo, sir. Mainne kata, why? I have not started. Okay, and another workshop, other things. So the problem is, because 10 years back, when we are explaining all these things, same thing with UGC, HRDC, people used to ask me, why this fellow is telling? Now the difference is, that tell me how to do this. So what is important is this experiential learning the 21st century skills are not meant for students. I'm sorry to say. It should be imbibed by the teachers first and the management first. We had to see that they should take care of that first of all. When the teacher has moved from the conventional classroom setup to the online what are the things where we, are, we were under scrutiny? Subject competency. Theoretically sound, theoretically good, practically sound, sir. Right? Why? Okay, so, what NEP said, we had to prepare the learners to meet the external real world problems. Any RC is giving this kind of a training to the teachers? Subject RCs? Any FIP programs are giving this kind of training to the faculty? The point is that when I'm explaining the basics, because when we explain in three levels, basics, advanced, application level. But anybody said to us, this is the way it should be taught? First point. Second important point, exposure to the latest pedagogical approaches. Because it, it will be very difficult, as Professor Sundar has said in the morning, it very difficult to uh, ask the student to sit in a class because the expectations are too high. Why? Then NEP said one more thing here in this context. Every teacher wants to make the process of learning impactful, engaging, interesting, and challenging for the learner. I repeat, this four. Every teacher wants to make the process of learning impactful, engaging, interesting and challenging for the learner. So the point is the pedagogical approaches, whatever we are going to use, should be latest and it should be at, uh, you know, connecting to the learner. I think Professor Narsimhu said rightly in the morning uh, about the star ratings of the teachers. Already it is there, student satisfactory survey in NAC. And one more interesting thing, I wish to say here, student opinion matters. You know what the students are saying? Some of the teachers are not inspiring. They are very good subject wise, but they are not inspiring. So these, all these factors will be considered while, uh, while doing so many things. I don't want to go back uh, whatever it is said. The second point is, we talk about a lot about the technology, whether it's the ABC, internship, 
the digital initiatives of government of india everything was technology driven what was the fear on the part of the teachers kehna bahut aasan hai are koi baat nahi teacher jo fittest for the survival har ek ke man mein dar hai what will happen what will happen how do we go about it we cannot give the low marks we cannot give the high marks and and you know there is a lot of stake technology will not replace the great teachers no doubt about it but technology in the hands of great teachers is transformational so we we had to create that kind of enabling environment when it comes to the teaching process few slides about the technology these are all my personal opinions people may disagree technology is not a miraculous cure for all educational elements i am a professor of computer science i am with the authority i am telling i must tell you one interesting anecdote probably i may please be allowed to say i was there in a kashmir university five years back to conduct a books workshop design develop and deliver books courses 150 faculty members are attending i early morning i reached around 3:30 in the morning i heard there was a pitch darkness wintry day very cold i asked the guest house in charge what was happened he said sir there was a power there is a transformer phuk gaya piche kharab ho gaya so what was they said la next to two days there is no power and he told me sir i hope you are you a resource person or a or a participant because most of the professors are attending during that time i said uh, no i am a resource person you know what is asked sir without power without power point how you will teach i said gentlemen your job is to get me fetch up fetch me a glass of uh, milk with good adrak or haldi leave the teaching to me you are not in a judgmental how do i teach chalo ho gaya so next uh, morning uh, i took a round and all the 150 people start all disciplines law to engineering attending that workshop so morning we had a good cup of uh, uh, tea and uh, uh, breakfast people are agitating call the vice chancellor call the director everybody i am the opening batsman like today i am a closing batsman because already target was set by uh, the legends like professor mangal sundar subramanya and uh, of course our uh, kumar and of course the honorable director of hrdc to mere samne kuch hai bas left hand mein khelna hai right hand mein khelna hai abhi to मौसम भी हैदराबाद में सही है गेंद स्विंग नहीं हो रही है ऑल दिस फैक्टर्स आई शुड कंसीडर सो मॉर्निंग आई वेंट एंड आई सेट एवरीबडी वॉज एजिटेटेड आई सेट आई ऑल्सो एजिटेटेड आई सेट सर देर आर टू ऑप्शन इन फ्रंट ऑफ अस ऑप्शन नंबर वन इन फ्रंट ऑफ द वाइस चांसलर ऑफिस वी विल पुट ए झंडा एंड विल से हाई 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 ओके आफ्टर वन आवर वी विल कम बैक सेकेंड इफ यू ऑल एग्री i'll start the workshop at 9:30 in the morning and everybody saying that people laughed and my own computer science people from nits to the iits to the iams and uh, aaats also laughed along with me they, are, they because our mindset was created that without power without powerpoint class will not happen i said no problem and uh, everybody agreed we start the class at 10 o'clock so i said this is a wonderful great opportunity mobiles are knocked out without battery and uh, laptop is not working okay and we why should we talk about the ikshwakko time that where this classes are held like this i said what for we came here okay it's a books workshop what is books workshop what is book first half an hour the first one is uh, what are the aspects to be considered in the books workshop design develop deliver course transaction assessment preparation and finally how to motivate how to engage how to encourage friends please keep in mind my students are not nptel students not engineering students my students are from social sciences my students are from humanities my students are from law there are different set of students not like uh, uh, only typical uh, discipline based believe me i said okay let's do since there is no power recording will be done tomorrow but before recording you should understand the pedagogy where we are using one of our best friend uh, uh, shridhar ayers uh, uh, learner centric mooc pedagogical approach we will be using in our classrooms 
So then I said, all these things can be done tomorrow. Let's design first. Write down some objectives. Write down some expected outcomes. Write down the outlines. Write down who are the people who can work along with you in designing, content development, delivery, and so on and so forth. Believe me, friends, it took me around six hours to complete this transaction. So by the time when the six hours process is on, light came within half an hour. But nobody left that room. That is the power of the teacher. That is the power of setting up of the environment. My point is that whether this technology will work or no technology. And now we talk about the blended, blending, breading, so many things, 40%, itna hi padao, 60%, utna hi padao. But these things cannot practically happening because we have to take all of them into confidence to do the needful. This is again one uh, old saying. And of course, this is a, applies for all disciplines, engineering to the all. Fine. So NEP talks about, uh, NEP talks three important things which I have already said to you. Quality education and teach innovatively. First point. Second point is this. Make the process of learning impactful, engaging, interesting and challenging for the learner. The third important thing is, while preparing the students, keep in mind this knowledge they should use in the external real world while facing their external real world problems. And this applies not only for engineering, this applies not only for the medicine, every discipline it will work. So if it is, if you keep this one in mind, so we, we, when, of course internships are happening, many other things are happening, companies are all, because I am there, part of many BOS of five, six uh, uh, private universities within Delhi and central universities also. My point is that whatever Cisco is teaching, whatever others are teaching, fine. But we want to see our faculty who are there in, in the campus should be doing this. Of course, this is what uh, NEP said and of course we know very well, I, I, I don't want to uh, move all these things into this. So what is, what is to be done at 21st century classroom? If you, if you translate what is there in the textbook into a nice, good looking PowerPoint presentation, we don't require any teacher. We don't require any teacher. What is important is simply transforming is not enough for me. What is important to me, we want to, we, it's necessary for a teacher to ensure that students are able to assimilate the information through appropriate and timely practices. The question is how? This is where the orientation is required to the teachers. This is where the orientation is required to the deans. This is where the orientation is required for the vice chancellors. We conduct regularly vice chancellors workshop. And uh, recently, you all must have heard about the G20. NEPA was given a very important role in the G20 initiatives. On 13th of this month, we are 13th and 14th of this month, we are conducting uh, G20. There are four topics will be given to us. One of the topic is on technology enabled teaching learning. And what are the best we did? and how, what we are showcasing to the G20 world. So this, this are thing. And when looking at the teacher, uh, look at this. Since the, the, the process has been changed, as mentioned by Subramanya, because we have a, a different set of learners are learning to us, whether it is a face-to-face -face class, whether it is an online class, whether it is a MOOCs class, whether it is an open and digital learning program, or a blended mode of teaching, or even the convention, the uh, online lecturing, we, we are looking for a good subject expertise. Second important thing, the <coughs> exposure to the latest pedagogical approaches. Number three, digital skills of the teacher. Well, and what are the digital skills of the teacher we are talking about? Because we used to promote all these things during our workshops. That we, we only talk about the, uh, you know, video mode of teaching. Okay, pre-recorded videos are fine. We made the videos interactive, fine. Audio lectures, fine. Uh, text material, fine. Simulations, fine. But what else? There are nice concepts maps are available. So you can explain the concept very easily and effectively through concept map. In my university, we have given certain credits to those students 
who have successfully completed and presenting these things because I could not find out uh, those slides over here so I'm not going to show that so first of all the teacher must be knowing and second point is you must be a practitioner first friends once you are a practitioner your flow will be different uh, because since morning sir it's talking about Narsan Musar is talking about the ABC academic bank of trades right currently we are we are holding a six days workshop for the Andhra Pradesh degree college lecturers some of our honored uh, or respected uh, principals are also attending this workshop over here and really I must tell you it's not only we are facilitating them a uh, wonderful experiences we are learning from them what was simple thing when, when you look at the a, a college in Andhra Pradesh it was associated it was affiliated it was connected with the uh, CC commissionerate of college education and of course the syllabus and curriculum will be from coming from the university and there is a higher, edu higher education council which is again guiding the universities and all we, we are getting people from the government degree colleges the private colleges and autonomous colleges the private and autonomous colleges the issue is not a big deal at all registering the ABC is not a big deal at all I think I hope I have uh, yeah I have done it yet yeah. The first and foremost thing, uh, there are, there are, uh, the first point is about the digi locker. We all know when you, when you can, you can app, we can uh, connect the app and uh, download the app. You know what was the practical difficulty? When we asked the people, when we asked the people to enter their Aadhaar number, Aadhaar number and mobile number, 80% cases, what I noticed is different. My Aadhaar number is different, Aadhaar, the mobile number connected with the Aadhaar is different. That's number one. First of all, we should be clear about that. And what UGC is saying, and from the Digi Locker, there are two uh, verticals are drawn. One is NAD, National Academic Depository. The another vertical is about Academic Bank of Credits. And if the, if the autonomous college is directly offering degrees, a, a private college is directly offering degrees, they can get registered themselves in NAD Digi Locker and they can upload their details over there. What we have noticed, only from 2016 onwards data is coming. And one of the principal recently, after going back, completing the course, they called me said, sir, my data is not visible in the digi locker. I said, sir, when did you complete your 10th uh, class? Sir, in 10th class somewhere in Baba Zam Ki Jamana. I said, sir, it was not done. Then who will be responsible? The university where you completed. Then he said, sir, my 10th class is from uh, school of SSC board. SSC board is already on, on, uh, on board, but they are trying their best slowly. Karenge? Abhi to time hai bhai. So, if we have to tell you about the next 10 years, we will tell you about all these things. Tell me, Then, same thing, intermediate board. Intermediate was that done in so many years back. It was not done. Only from 2016 onwards, the student can able to. That is one part of the ABC which was not touched, so I am touching that part. Registration, fine. Registration is not a big deal at all. Coming to these uh, ABCs, you can see. What was the first one? And these are not, not my words. Huh? This has been said by the Honorable Chairman of the UGC in several webinars he is conducting. It is again the public domain. Registration of the, all the students in the beginning of the semester in the ABC. Okay, here I will tell you one small interesting thing. This circular has come to all the colleges across Delhi. My daughter is studying in one of the law college. She said, uh, um, uh, Appa, I want to, we want to complete the registration. I said, what is registration? No, no, no. I said, she is already having a digi locker. Where are Aadhaar number, PAN number, COVID certificate. What else? The few things are there, which was already there. So she said, no, okay, well, Appa, what has been done? It was done. Then uh, her colleague said, you complete two courses, which is being offered by NLU, uh, NLU Delhi. Then I said, why should the college will tell you which courses you should do in this swayam? Because today, uh, Sir is also mentioning that uh, open and distant learning oblique, swayam oblique NPTEL courses. But I have not seen, I think I am stand corrected by Dr. Gopakumar. 
I have not seen any circular from end by the Honorable Secretary of. Okay, she completed two grades. Uh, she completed two courses of uh, four four grade each, and these grades were there. So she is asking me, Papa, I have completed these four credit uh, two courses. Then what is my advantage? I said, you ask your college. She went to the because like father, uh, my daughter is also a little uh, uh, fast. She went and asked the dean academic services. Dean asked her to meet the registrar. Registrar asked her to meet the controller of examination. Controller of examination asked her to meet the vice pro vice chancellor. Pro vice chancellor asked her to meet the proctor. Proctor asked me to meet the rector. Rector finally sent you meet and go to vice chancellor. The vice chancellor will speak. She went to the vice chancellor and see the ordeal of the student. Okay, this I am saying that even after so many two years and so many. Uh, documents from the uh, ABC uh, about the implement any implementation. The innocence and ignorance is prevailed in this country. So finally, she went to the vice chancellor. Vice chancellor said, uh, he he knows me. He identifies my daughter. He said, uh, how come you came here, uncle? There is a ABC uncle. I have registered for ABC as per the uh, notification issued by the college. I cleared two courses, and nobody is telling me what will be happening that. You know what is the answer that Vice Chancellor gave? On the lighter side, eh? don't take it seriously. I am requesting your father to come and connect the, conduct the ABC training for the faculty. What is ABC training I need to conduct? I need to tell, uh, holding the mouse, what is step one, what is step two, enter the Aadhaar number, enter the mobile number. Then, what is the second thing? Taking approval from statutory authorities like BOS, Academic Council, and Board of Management. The Vice Chancellor said, uh, no, I'm convincing my members. It will take some more time. How many, how much more time? Because there are already two amendments we got it under ABC. Point number three, student cell. Every, stu every college or university must be having Student cell should upload the credits gained by the students in the ABC portal. Fourth one, using the social media platforms to create the awareness among the faculty, staff, dealing with the students and uh, uh, the uh, faculty, uh, students and, of course, sorry, students and the faculty. Informing the students about the ABC benefits and provide them the necessary hand-holding don't do much things. Whatever the UGC chairman is saying, the videos are available. Why don't we share the videos with the faculty members? Why do, what, what is wrong in sharing with the students? What is the great thing to share? Next, creating a hyperlink in the, uh, about the ABC in, the, in your university website and it should be prominently uh, visible to all the visitors. Designate ABC nodal officers and display their details in the website. And uh, the officers must be senior level associated with the admissions and registration process. And they must have aware of what was the expected to be done. If, I, if, if a student uh, uh, secured uh, some grades, so at least then when to redeem, what was the process, and how it is being connected with the uh, 50, up to 50% they can add the grades. One more thing, this is not my words. Conducting capacity building program for faculty and staff. And what was the last one? Institutions should insist that students must fill up the ABC ID in all examination forms. This was said by the Honorable uh, Chairperson. And if you register for any NPTEL courses or Swayam courses, they are asking for the ABC ID. But my point is that how many students have that awareness? I think from this meeting onwards, what is important for us that this should be made mandatory. At least we need to tell 10 people why it is important. Why, what was the advantage of that? You see what Professor Narsimlu is telling. And my daughter is told to the teacher saying that, no, I think I, I'm going to earn the, so many credits from these institutions. And what was told? No, 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 it was not put into the BOS and academic councils. Till the time it was not put place in the BOS and academic council, we cannot accept that. 
Finally, it was resolved amicably. My point is that I think this, these aspects has to be taken into consideration very seriously. Now, now coming to the next one of the important uh, point which I just want to bring to your kind attention. As I already mentioned to you, before the corona, we have three, uh, three teaching learning processes and environments. After the corona, till now, we have three. One of the point uh, which was uh, uh, highlighted in the new educational policy is the blended mode of teaching. It was there in page number 62 uh, of the subject 24.4. What it says, while promoting the digital learning in education, the importance of face-to-face, in-person learning is fully recognized. Accordingly, different effective models of blended learning will be identified for appropriate replication for different subjects. UGC constituted a six-member committee and people from the different practitioners and a few of them from engineering background and uh, one professor from uh, IIIT and one of the commission member was the chairman of this. I was one of the member and uh, from educational technology one senior professor and of course many of them, one from the school education was called and we brainstormed for eight months. A rigorous brainstorm was done and we said one thing very clearly. Probably you may be interpreting 60%, 40%, up to 60% and up to 40% here. But we said very clearly that blended, blended learning is blending of the teaching learning experiences in on-site and online environments. One of the environments which I just showed to you in the second slide, my own portal, it was done with a zero costing, with a Moodle uh, learning environment. When I'm teaching faculty like this, I have a certain, certain information was simply available on the site. But for my students, because I need to know what was the progression they made after first week, after second week, after third week, since I had to evaluate them, every student was given a username and password. For the general public, I have not done anything. What was the rocket science there? People used to ask me that, sir, how much effort? Nothing, no effort was made. I, I took a simple two, three, two, three important decisions while planning this. Number one, my classroom, even how effective I teach in a conventional classroom, I can meet only 20 to 30 percent of my students. And of course, I must tell you that I teach in two institutions, one in adjunct faculty engineering institution, and the one is from uh, uh, NEPA. The kind of students I am I'm, I'm teaching are fabulous. You cannot go just like that and go and teach. So what was happened? So I created an environment which is beyond their class hours and schedule. So this, this environment facilitates the learners to learn on their own pace, space and time. And I follow the similar, the four quadrant approach. Our, uh, N, uh, that Swayam has been followed, video lectures. And the moment you say video lectures, you all must be thinking that, sir, you must have prepared so many videos, you must have a wonderful studio. No, we don't have a studio on our own, but we share the studio with our uh, uh, sister institution, NCRT. But 90% of my videos are OER material, which is already available in the public domain. Open educational resources with creative commons attribution licenses. Number one. Number two, uh, and apart from that, I use the digital initiatives of Government of India in higher education, which is already there. Number three, uh, the uh, digital initiatives of the state government institutions. I'm happy to say the government of Andhra Pradesh, we were tr we trained around uh, 500 faculty members five years back in NIT Warangal. I'm happy to say that they have created a wonderful learning management system, which is a road, which is a role model for many uh, 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 commissionerate of college education across India. I'm happy to say that. So.
very good ma'am very good so okay. we are uh, we are very familiar with sir and uh, we had a number of classes with sir our commissionate of college and education was very uh, energetic and motivated all our faculty to uh, coordinate with sir and many other arun khan madam and so many people and learn so many things from the scratch in the uh, corona period and we learned lms and we learned obs and we learned screencastify all the software tools now we are able to uh, actually do our own lectures and videos very easily just because of your uh, motivation and everything sir i'm very happy to say good, this good ma'am and uh, even uh, all the faculties also thank you thank you sir thank you so what is no uh, i don't stop here i want to go one step ahead so professor Mangal Sundar has created a wonderful video for my chemistry teachers. I don't want to give that video just like that to them because he must have created around 40 minutes of video. In the 40 minutes of video, he must have explained four theoretical concepts and four practical concepts. Right? So, it's a 40 minutes video. There are eight important points were explained. Each point was 5 minutes duration. If I give the 40 minutes video, as a teacher my job is over. No, that's not correct. What we are propagating as part of the learner centric uh, approach which was uh, designed by, it was initially people talks about only in engineering education, but many scores social science, mein, humanities, mein, itna prachar karke kar diya. and many of the, the members JK and uh, um, Samir are part of my team. What was done? I'll tell you, explain simply. After five minutes watching the video, the video get paused. After watching that first five minutes of the video, the video get, first of all, that 40 minutes video we made into two parts. 20 minutes and 20 minutes. And first 20 minutes got uh, uh, three important concepts of six, six minutes duration. For example, after six minutes of the video, watching the video, the video gets paused. And what has been explained by Professor Mangal Sundar during the sixth minute, say last six minutes, zero, zero to the six minutes, the question will be asked. So this is the pedagogical, this we call it as a, they call it as a learner centric model which talks about three important things. Number one, it, bring, it breaks the monotony of watching the videos. Because students have started saying, two big videos, two big videos. And only thing is, we talked about the assessment and activity uh, as a third, active, third quadrant or fourth quadrant. No, I don't want to talk about that. In the video itself, after six minutes of the video, video gets paused. Then the student has to ask the question. Now here, you, you may be asking about the kind of questions and all. It can be knowledge level question. It can be application level. It can be support, testing the critical thinking or it can be testing the analytical thinking. Depends on the VD, depends on the content what Professor Mangal Sundar has explained. Afterward, student has to take the test on the video. Okay? And of course, it, it goes forward. If he wants to take the reverse back, it can go back. But what is important need to understand as a teacher point of view, how many times the student has watched this video. And such kind of applications are available friends. It can show you that for this first six minutes of the segments, student watched three times. Why it is required? It's not only for the before the classroom interaction. Once the student complete this kind of action and he will come prepare the class, he will come to the class with a much preparation and a confidence. Now, after the six minutes, first second is over, the video goes on. Then he talks about on a practical part. He explains, I want to see, I want to see after 12 minutes and one second, again the video gets paused. I want to see that what was under, what was the understanding of the students. This is what the, it, it is being practiced already. Because when they develop this kind of a model, they talk about the two things, structural pause point and the logical pause point. I don't want to go beyond that. There are, there are four quadrants are there. I don't want to do that. 
What is important to me, content development is not required. Whatever content which is already available there by the wonderful institutions in this country, it's enough. What is important is how do this content connect it to the learner? Have you created that environment? And one more thing, we talk about assessment, assessment, assessment. I don't know, I completely agree with uh, Narsimhulu sir. Why should we have the three hours test at the end? Which is of no meaning at all. After completing this test also, you don't know uh, what need to be done. I have excellent examples in Delhi. Four of my friend's daughters, uh, one, two, one, two sons and two daughters of different families. They got 100 out of 100 in plus two. They have not cleared one of the uh, online test. Glad they failed. Of course, IITJE is not that. And then CUET, common entrance test, none of them cleared. Ek bar unke ghar gaya, sab log aise baithe the, soak sab. Maine yaar kya ho kya gaya? Keh rahe yaar ki doctor sab kya batao? Mere beti ne bahut galti kiya. Kya galti kiya? Aur is soak sab marks aage yaar, soak ya si aage aata ho. See, if you scored 55 percent marks is enough now. Aur yaar soak sab aage aata, kya karna? Soak sab. What I'm trying to say that, so I think the institutions, the regulations, the regulatory bodies, they may be saying that. But tomorrow, you have certain component of your assessments. You have around 50 marks or 40 marks as internal assessment. Who is stopping you to conduct all these things? I, I don't know, somebody's mentioned about. You have excellent formative assessment tools. Let me just take you to that part. <coughs> I have a lot of things to say, but uh, you know all these things I am skipping. <coughs> yeah. What is the need of the hour? This is not only meant for only few disciplines. Everyone, whether you are a teacher, whether you are a student, whether you are an administrator, everybody should know this. What are the things? Synchronous learning tools. If I said synchronous learning tools, many of you must be love. No, no, sir, we are using Zoom for last two years. How many percentage of the features you are using in the Zoom? As simple as that. Okay, and many times people are struggling. Where is my PPT? My why my PPT is not coming? And which tab has to be opened? Which tab has to be closed? So like Jitsi is already there. We have the ministry is using many other things. Now, I've been talking about in the blended mode of learning. We talk about the a, a platform which is supporting the learning of the learners beyond the classroom and schedule. And this facilitates the learners to learn on their own pace, space, and time. Only I'm, I, I don't talk about only Swayam or some other edX platforms or future learn platforms. Everyone may not be that much uh, level to go that. You can create a platform on your own. This is what we want to de develop within India. You can create on your own. It's not a great deal at all. You can take Google Classroom, simple to use. Uh, can I ask you a simple question not to be mistaken? How many of you are using Google Classroom here? You see? Only few hands were risen. If I ask a Moodle, many people will must be thinking, Are karu, na karu, pata nahi yaar. Inke class to attend kiya tha. Kal to milenge online pe, puchega. Pata nahi ye NAC ve ban ke aajayega. Maybe I may be coming to your institution in the NAC next time. You said, sir, you taught us very nicely in Professor Narsimlu sir's workshop. But you know what I'm going to ask? Where is the outcome? Where is the outcome? Outcome is more important to me, not giving a nice lectures. We want to see. So let's start. Why don't we? Are, why we are not starting? Is it a rocket science? Facilitating the learning of the learners beyond the classroom and schedule, and connecting these on-site and online. Is the blended? Are you counted a blended? Whatever it may be. What is important to me? Create and you know, uh, in the second slide, I said one statement. Students are asking very fundamental question, sir. As per the ABC or as per the UGC guidelines, 
engineering students please don't ask me the names of those in because it's part of my NAC initiative so I don't want to name them because whatever we discuss with the students the principal will not be knowing the vice chancellor will not be knowing even the exit meeting also will say goody goody and come out we'll be writing all these things in the in the report eh? what students are saying sir two courses are being taught in a face-to-face -face environment we are taking three courses by two courses by professor mangal sundar he is teaching so excellently sir he's already set up a standard sir some of the standards can't be used in the classroom means can we have this face to face courses in a blended mode online and offline can't we conduct formative assessment tools can't we use the formative assessment tools like this can't we use the summative assessment tools what is stopping and one more thing, we talk about a lot about the discussion forum in the MOOCs. And you know, uh, I think Professor Sundar only said, it started with 600 and finally taking the test only 10, clearing 4, okay, certificate will be issued. Sir, probably it may be true in your case, sir. If it happens in my institution, my vice chancellor will give a nice prem patra from the ministry and, and I'll be getting a nice call in the morning. VC is, VC is how you call it, 8.30. And wait, 8.30 when VC is telling to call you for a cup of tea, something seriously wrong. And one of the faculty member got this kind of letter saying that you got 5,000 students, finally took test 100 and cleared only 10. He can't write. But when the 5,000 students joined, he put it in the Facebook saying that 5,000 students joined in this course offered by a Ministry of Education, Government of India institution. But when only 10 are clearing, then what happened? We took a small survey. You know what happened? Sir, the content is excellent, sir. Both video content, audio content, text content is excellent. Sir, when it comes to the discussion forum, and they're all social science question. Sir, when you're asking the question, there is no reply, even after three months. Assessments conducted, high quality, international standard, and questions were asked. Of course, comparing are more than Karin Millen, or uh, Oxford, Harvard, Yale, King's College, that level of questions. But we don't know whether my questions are, my answers were correct or not. And the last point, sir, we don't get any motivation we don't get any engagement, effective engagement. We don't get any encouragement from the faculty. And uh, this document, I showed to the, my vice chancellor. Sir, this is the feedback. Okay, we will try to improve upon. Sir, can I call the faculty meeting tomorrow? No, no, Srinivas, you are very fast. We'll, we'll take up this one in 2028 or 2035 and we'll see how this can be done. Why are we afraid of all these things? The logic is, sir, again I am telling you, <coughs> every student is a diamond in this country. Every teacher is a diamond in this country. Only thing is, we should know how to shine them. Don't, blow, don't put a stamp on them. Everybody is a good. Again, I am coming back to what Adi Shankara said. It is the way we look it wrongly. That's all. So, what is wrong in using this kind of uh, summative assessment tools? Simple to use. And we talk about uh, the discussion forum. We talk about so many things. How many of us are using the Jamboard? Why only three, sir? Of course, I also use this. Why only, why only few? Jamboard is an excellent tool. Padlet, we talked, started using it. It's a collaborative working. Create that environment. Once the environment was set up, learning happens. It's not my words. The great Albert Einstein said. So my point is, whether it's an assessment, then transfer, all these things will later. Okay? Now, and apart from Jamboard, let's try with Idea Flip and Lenoid. All these uh, PowerPoint presentations, I leave it with him. Or if you need not uh, leave it here, if you go to profkeshrinivas.in, all these things are in the public domain. 
you can download it, you can use it, reuse it, revise it, remix it, re redistribute, and no attribution is required. That is important point to be noted down. No attribution is required, no need to give any attribution to me. But you should only request is, you should make this one like a kind of a thing, make it prachar. Because government of India, our state governments, our institutions have done a lot for us. We the teachers need to know. Shared document tools. Of course, we are all very comfortably saying uh, Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, very good. But how many of you heard about Etherpad, Scatterspoke, Idea Boards? Try out these things. They're all need of their work. You know, uh, 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 Dr. Subramania is saying that next five years, a lot of things are going to happen. This is all, these are all the things already happening, sir. But we'll take a lot of steam when, when all of us can come together. <clears throat> Concert mapping and mind mapping. It's already there. So, excellent uh, way of interpreting a concept. And one of my friends, he's no more. He was his doctor, Professor Piley from uh, uh, RIA Mysore. He's developed a wonderful uh, uh, concept map on open educational resources. I, I'm not finding uh, space, I will show you there. Has done excellently well. So we can also do many concepts, many lab activities, many experiential learning can be explained very easily and effectively with uh, concept map and mind map. Uh, so, of course, if you are comfortable with uh, Padlet, you can do it. Digital content development tools. No studio, no video is required as such. You can look at this, these tools. Of course, uh, Madam is saying that we are using OBS. No, fine, OBS is one way. But we are talking about uh, six minutes videos, seven minutes videos. Screen capturing videos, picture in picture videos. These things can be, I think, you know, uh, this kind of orientation is required to make the process of learning impactful, engaging, interesting, and challenging. Since already I got a hint from uh, the Honorable Director, I'll stop my presentation here. As I already told you, that uh, my hands are a little shivering because I, I wish to st uh, oh, touch the uh, keyboard and try to explain to you that how the concept map need to be prepared. Okay, but anyway, I'm not going to do that. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thanks for the patient here. First of all, uh, thank you for the engross into that because he practices those things. That's what I told him. If at all somebody wants to enjoy his sessions, either you attend sessions in Nipa or you ask him to come to your place to do that. Then only you will enjoy. It is not one hour, one day. It is really a five-day test match. You can really enjoy his sessions. And some. Quote, unquote, and some. Even in online, we did online practice from our HRDs. Just because of the initiative he has suggested, my friend uh, uh, Dr. Kimabindu from Usmania University, other uh, friend Dr. Murugan here, we all tried this and we started even sharing videos of three minutes, five minutes, what to do. After the session, they can repeat and they can learn. That's how we did it. So it's not one day effort of uh, learning these things. Uh, why I am uh, Concluding this session, uh, let us not get into the time schedule beyond five. Uh, Vice Chancellor said that he is in another validity week. I would like to conclude this. Will it be all right? Yes. And we will have then tea. And guests also, they have to leave by 5, 5, 15. So I would like to uh, thank each one of you. It is because of you the program went on very well. So my appreciation to all of you, those who have travelled and reached this place. I know that they are, there are some limitations in our guest house. Still people could able to uh, understand and uh, uh, what do you call, uh, did not complain to me 
uh, I am very happy and uh, I express my uh, thanks to all of you. And the second foremost thing, let me tell you, Professor Mangal Sundar, when I asked him, sir, can you go away? He said, I have, I have to travel to Canada and I have so many things, but still for one day, Hyderabad traveling one hour, I will try to make And I sincerely thank you for accepting our invitation. <laughs> I'm not happy for that, but you've been able to find time and you have uh, done your uh, job very well. And I thank Dr. Subramanian. Uh, I, I treat him as a, because I am in their family, I also accept him. So thank you very much, sir, for going over here. Of course, Srinivas is part of our HRDC. I need not uh, tell him separately, but yes, thank you very much, Srinivas. And my friend Gopu Kumar from uh, UGC, uh, thank you very much for uh, getting us that. And we will give you some inputs. I will take the feedback before I am not concluding this meeting. Uh, some of the uh, outcomes of this seminar, we will draft and send it to you. Because it is still in the draft mode, you can easily think of uh, doing this. Make ABC as simple as possible, please. And credit transfer also. Somewhere down the line, UGC also should issue a BIP and say that this is what. Full stop and do this. From this date you should do this, come and do it. Right? Don't give any open-ended letters in this direction. Then it will work out. Right? So before uh, I conclude, may I have one or two people to give the feedback. Don't go on thanking us. Say critically what you have learned, what you have understood. Any two participants. The house is open for you. Any two participants. What happened? <laughs> Sir, Professor, thank you, sir, for giving us the opportunity to meet you all. Uh, I have a couple of points to share with you all, sir. Um, the content is very good, and uh, the, the, it's really a full day for us. And my submission is because we have a secretary from UGC also. Uh, sir, uh, please don't uh, take it otherwise. Uh, at times, in, and I'm talking in more a general way, at times we're getting contradictory statements from higher education and UGC. Research is not, in a, not required for faculty uh, positions. Sometimes uh, uh, APA score is not necessary. So contradictory statements are coming from UGC. It is leaving us completely in utter confusion. First thing. Second thing is, uh, once you bring this uh, credit transfer and credit framework and uh, NEP into practice, into practice, put them in practice, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind for all the colleges, particularly I am from a uh, university which is having around 190 affiliate colleges, out of which 32 are autonomous colleges, autonomous given by UC. Now, all these 32 colleges are going for BYS every year. And they have, you have to give only guidelines. Higher education or AACT or UGC always gives guidelines. And the autonomous body is always just here and there, they tweet something, change something, and they they put them in BOAs and they complete the job. Now, once you have multiple exit and entry policy, one a student X uh, leaves one college and goes to other colleges, there will be a, some, uh, I mean, uh, the equilibrium will be disturbed. And you, you have answered that question, said that uh, the guidelines are uh, under preparation, right? Uh, uh, guidelines are what you call uh, modules, I think. Uh, again, if you say guidelines, my suggestion to you also, my, my suggestion to you also, to you, sir. Well, uh, once you say guidelines, there is a fair chance of again uh, doing it the, this way or that way. So it will be a hectic schedule again on the university's part and uh, examination session. So try to bring a new uniform, that's a very, well, uh, very welcoming uh, this thing, sir, for today's student and uh, making the system more student-centric. We are always welcoming, that's why, uh, though I missed the advertisement, I asked Professor Ryan, sir, to send me a link and <laughs> join this uh, uh, conference today. Let's keep these things in mind, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Adani. Thank you very much. See, it is uh, the question of guidelines preparing for faculty recruitment. Uh, 
yes, uniform. Here and there, there may be some, uh, uh, what do you call, conditions. Once you are in university system, you are supposed to follow university UGC norms. That's it. And still, if you say that you have to go with the AICT, even though you have an engineering department in your university, it is for the university and your executive council can take a call. Neither UGC nor AICT will give a reply to that. Right? The second part is, with respect to multiple entry, multiple exit, we have already discussed and I can explain you again and again. Things will not be that difficult when we actually start seeing people, right? Don't be in a hurry to Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. I am Dr. R.T. Bede. I belong to the same practice institute to which Professor Mr. Miller belongs. I met him in 2015 as a participant of my sort of course he conducted in the same HRDC. And I think I heard Professor Srinivas also there in 2015. Uh, what the merit of this seminar has been to me? This seminar tried to make the things as simple as possible. Because UGC circulated so many circular notifications we read them on website in prints. But the question remains there, how to do it? Because each and every question that raises in my mind or in our mind, the document can't answer. We need those people who have played some instrumental role, who have many sittings, many meetings on those issues. And when they come face to face with us, as ma'am asked so many questions that my dear uh, colleagues who were sitting behind me, they also raised the question. So, in that regard, this seminar served its purpose. But sir, uh, I'm grateful to you. The best of the future person today you have been there. Uh, you took initiative. But this is beginning only. Much more need to be done. This is only beginning. And I'm very happy and I'm confident that Professor Narsim will be doing it and taking it ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Kamakshi from Kakati Institute of Technology and Science, Varenga. Of course, sir said not to say thanks, but I thank everyone and especially professors. Uh, because from the morning, it is a, um, we are learning, we are having a great experience. But one thing I want to say that, of course, we learned a lot from our childhood and we're still learning and we are teaching. But now, uh, I think this is an era where we are going to change uh, the next generation mindset regarding the education system. Because what we thought, while we are studying, okay, we are not able to change. Suppose I, I uh, as a student, I have some other interest, but that time it was not possible. And now we, ha uh, we are providing our student a chance to learn different uh, courses in the education system. So definitely this will give an opportunity to the students and uh, it, will say, uh, it will change the mindset of the parents, the students, as well as the society. So yes, of course, this is the beginning. And, uh, as, uh, and all of us are in the same status now, I think so. And uh, all seems to be updated. So regarding this, I want to say only a few lines that regarding this workshop, that during this change, हम सब लड़खड़ाएंगे, गिरेंगे, उठेंगे, फिर गिरेंगे, फिर उठेंगे, पर चलना जरूर सीखेंगे. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. From the people who cannot follow Hindi, yeah, <laughs> very nicely said. And while walking, we may fall, right? Again, we will get up, start walking. Again, you will fall, but keep continue. Sir, sir, I like, I like uh, the same thing, and I don't know how many of you understand their good grammar. We let them forget to. 
लेदंते नडू लेदंते पापु आगे को बेचारा keep on uh, talking like this and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, i wish all of you very well most important please stay active teachers may retire from workplace but they will never retire from work please understand okay. all the best for all of you Yeah, good evening, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we are extremely happy to interact with uh, and learn from. Uh, yes, at the age of 66 years, sir, Professor Mangal Chandra, sir. Very, very, very inspiring session. Thank you so much. I thank uh, Dr. Gopu Kumar Garu from UGC for uh, spending a lot of his precious time to share his knowledge. I am really thrilled to learn from uh, Professor Subramanya. Amazing, sir. R V R R Bangalore. You are setting a great example. Uh, we will consider it, this model as a role model, and we will we'll definitely come up to your expectation. We are from Kids Warangal. I am uh, Dr. Narendra Reddy, head of the department Mechanical Engineering. Thank you so much, K. Srinivas sir. Really amazing, uh, inspiring session. We are re really enjoyed your learning. Thank you so much. So here, my job. What of thanks. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> so I will not say anything except all the best. Thank you very much. Go back safely.